Welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lore Series audiobook. Contained within is an audio-only version of our Elder Scrolls Lore Series on YouTube. This is Season 1 of Elder Scrolls Lore, and it is by far the lowest quality as far as audio is concerned. If you'd like a better quality audio experience, skip over to Season 2. For those of you who would like to listen to a bonus commentary on how the Elder Scrolls Lore Series got started then stay tuned for the next couple minutes. Otherwise, you can fast forward this audiobook to around minute 8. Uh, so this is season 1 of uh, Elder Scrolls Lore, which premiered on the Shoddy Cast in uh, February of 2013. So from the time I'm recording this right now, it's it's been over a year. And um, this was actually the first piece of lore content we ever produced for the channel. Going back through season one, when I was doing this audiobook here, it's really funny because our equipment, I feel, was awful. The audio quality is really, really bad. <laughs> it's not nearly as good. I mean, we had no support at all um, for the channel at that point. Uh, no donations or anything like that coming in. So revenue was non-existent at the time. We just weren't, uh, weren't able to afford anything. And uh, at the time, the Shoddy Cast was just doing uh, Elder Scrolls Online content. Before that, the Shoddy Cast was doing Guild Wars 2 uh, content. So we were doing like a couple Let's Plays here and there. Again, this is at this time, we have maybe like a couple hundred viewers, maybe like a couple thousand subs. Uh, so so not not that popular at the time. So anyway, I was really, really excited for The Elder Scrolls Online, and uh, that excitement took the form of wanting to learn more about the game. And so I was pretty much searching online for as many articles and things I could read about the game. And when I ran out of stuff to read, I started to study the lore of the video games. And uh, whenever you want to study lore for The Elder Scrolls, you pretty much have two options. Uh, well, three, maybe, if you really want to think about it. Uh, the first option is to read in-game books. So, uh, obviously, the Elder Scrolls is very, very famous for having their vast, vast libraries of lore books, which are very, very well fleshed out and very long. Um, another way you could study lore at that time was uh, to, obviously, read the wiki pages, and I feel like that's probably the most popular and, you know, easy to access. You could pull it... <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> I'm choking on a pretzel. I'd pretty much spend my day playing Skyrim, and then at night I would read uh, read a couple wiki articles about lore. And then the last way was you could go on YouTube and search Elder Scrolls lore, which is pretty much uh, just people reading wiki pages is what that is. There had to be other people like me who wanted to learn more about the lore of video games, but didn't want to necessarily spend a bunch of time you know just reading wiki article after wiki article because that does get stale at least for the majority of people so yeah anyway i saw that open market i saw no one was filling it even though i definitely wasn't anywhere near qualified to do it i never considered myself a quote-unquote lore master like some of these other people but uh, i was willing to put in the work and so we started the lore series and uh, it was a couple months in when it started really gaining traction. People were sharing it with their friends, which was a, a huge help. Um, and uh, we didn't really get too much help from ZeniMax. I was always hoping they would post it on their like uh, Facebook or, or Twitter or something like that. But uh, there wasn't really any help from the devs as far as spreading the word at that point. It was just uh, it was like people sharing it. And that's what I really appreciated about the Elder Scrolls lore community at large it was just even though i know for a fact it isn't the best like lore series it could be there it's there's so many mistakes and there's so many problems with it uh people still really embraced it and we were uh yeah we were really ecstatic about that writing the scripts for the lore series and you know narrating it setting the kind of tone for it was so much fun to me because it what it let me do and i love rpgs i was always a big rpg nerd is like role play with YouTube, basically. I would say the topic this week about Elder Scrolls lore was about uh, the Imperials. There was an Imperials episode in there, and what I would do is I would sit down and uh, I would start researching information about Imperials, but I would only take information that I, I would think like the Imperials would want you to know. So, and uh, that was kind of my way of overcoming this uh, this kind of crippling thing with the Elder Scrolls lore series. And that's that uh, the lore in it is so, like, uh, 
so scattered. Uh, and by that, I mean the Elder Scrolls, and this is what really draws the lore community into the Elder Scrolls, I feel. It's all up for debate. There's no real solid, solid canon facts. They're very few and far in between. And uh, when you can find a, a, a solid piece of canon, then you tend to latch onto it because the lore and history of the universe comes strictly from the citizens of that universe. And by that, I mean when you, when you pick up a book in the Elder Scrolls universe, that book was written by somebody that resides within the Elder Scrolls. So that book is very, very subject to their bias. So you could read a book, for instance, I was reading this one Elder Scrolls uh, book that was about, uh, I think it was called like a pig children or something. Or it was like, it was talking about basically how orcs are just awful. And the book was obviously written from the perspective of someone who doesn't like orcs at all. And so uh, it's just one of those things that you could read that book and say, oh, Orcs are terrible. They're, they're a terrible people. And uh, you can make a lore video about that, how orcs are just awful. But no, there's a bunch of other different accounts from how uh, orcs have an actual uh, s sense of nobility, if anything, a sense of a very strong sense of honor within the, uh, the lore universe. And you can, you can talk about that as well. All the NPCs, again, another not very reliable source at least if you're looking for purely lore facts they're very subject to their own bias that's something with season one i felt like i did not emphasize enough and for that reason uh people tend to attack the uh the elder scrolls lore series uh particularly season one because uh it, it presented a lot of those rumors within the elder scrolls lore series as just fact when in fact they're not Anyway, long story short, uh, this audiobook here that you're about to listen to is actually the, the poorest quality out of any of the other ones. You'll find the other audiobooks are very, very professional, and uh, the narration sounds sounds so much better, if only just because it's done with better equipment. At the time we started this season one of Elder Scrolls lore, my equipment was uh, less than up to snuff, I think. Um, it Well... You'll see. <laughs> anyway, I'm just yammering on now, so uh, enjoy the uh, audio book. Uh, <laughs> know that the others are, are much better, and uh, on behalf of all the creators here at the ShoddyCast, thank you for your patronage. Uh, enjoy. Tamriel, Don's beauty in the language of the Altmer, or Tazukan in the dragon's tongue, is the continent upon which all the Elder Scrolls games take place. Home to many diverse races, and even more conflicts, Tamriel has been host to many adventures. You've experienced Tamriel in your own way, but want to learn more about its story. Well, to get to the heart of the story, you have to go back to the beginning. What better place to start than at the dawn of time itself? This is Tamriel. It is but a single continent on the planet known as Nern. As we broaden our perspective, we can see Nern is part of other heavenly bodies, like moons and planets. These heavenly bodies make up the realm of existence called Mundus. Mundus itself was the brainchild of Lorcan, the missing god. Magnus, the divine being we draw our magic from, acted as the architect to help the Lorcan by laying out the plans for Mundus' creation. As powerful as Lorcan and Magnus were, creating an entire realm of existence was a monumental task that required help from the Aedra, who are more commonly known as the Divines. It's pretty unclear whether the Aedra willingly volunteered in creation, or if Lorcan in fact tricked them, but in the end, the Aedra gave part of themselves for the creation of Mundus, and in turn, they created Nern and Tamriel as we know it today. However, not every godlike being agreed with our creation. Daedra is the name given to the divine beings that did not take part in creation. Unlike the Aedra, the Daedra are thought to retain the full might of their power because they elected to sit out while Mundus was being constructed. The citizens of Tamriel worship both the Daedra and the Aedra, however the latter is more widely accepted in the Greater Empire. More on that later. 
Suffice it to say, the only thing we'll be concerning ourselves with is the biggest and most significant planet in Mundus, Nern. There are five known continents on Nern. The continent of Akavir, also known as Dragonland, is the landmass east of Tamriel. History has proven that Tamriel and Akavir have a very hostile attitude toward each other to say the least. Akavir has invaded Tamriel several times in the past, and we know that Tamriel has invaded Akavir at least once. We as citizens of Tamriel know very little about Akavir, and much of the information we do hold is acknowledged to be incomplete or inaccurate altogether. The continent of Atmora is the landmass north of Tamriel, and legend says that it was from here that the first humans came. It was Yskimor, the ancient Atmorian king who fled civil war in Atmora, determined to make a new life for his people in Tamriel. The western continent of Yakuda, which sank into the sea in ancient times, was the original home of the Red Guards. Although Yakuda no longer exists, it is included on the map of western Tamriel. What in fact caused Yakuda to sink remains shrouded in mystery, but the Red Guards themselves seem to be under the impression that the destruction of Yakuda was in some way their fault. Upon the sinking of their homeland in the First Era, the Yakudan fleet set sail to the east, where they shored in Tamriel. Birthplace of the Elves, Altmeris is one of Nern's greatest mysteries. So little is known about this southern continent that some question its very existence. Some moth priests say that Altmeris is not a physical place, but actually a collection of images existing only in the minds of the elves themselves. It's hard to argue with the moth priests considering their claim is based on a near infallible source, the Elder Scrolls themselves. Now we arrive in Tamriel, a land of swords and magic, bigotry and barbarism, social and political intrigue. An era does not come and go without a conspiracy or without blood being spilled for one cause or another. Our vast continent is a land divided, divided by race, divided by culture, and often divided by greed. The most apparent divisions are identified by the nine provinces that help define Tamriel's diverse people. To the north lies Skyrim, cold and rugged. Though currently inhabited primarily by Nords, the elves who they replaced had resided there since time immemorable. Skyrim is the province where Yskimor, the ancient Atmorian king, first made landfall after crossing the Sea of Ghosts. A legendary hero of men, Yskimor would later make conquest on the elves in a major event known as the Return, and in doing so, he would send a message to all of Tamriel. From then on, the race of men were here to stay. In the northeast lies Morrowind, which is dominated by the island of Vardenfell, which in turn is dominated by Red Mountain, a massive volcano. Red Mountain will erupt twice in Morrowind's history, each time having profound effects on the province. Some species of Vardenfell even depend on the ashfall for survival. Modern Morrowind becomes home to the Dark Elves after they are banished from Cyrodiil for committing the capital offense of Daedra worship. In the southeast lies the swampland known as Black Marsh, home to the reptilian race known as the Argonians, as well as a race of sentient trees known as the Hist. The mysterious Argonians are native to Black Marsh, and they organize themselves on the tribal level with great efficiency. Southern Tamriel yields itself to great deserts and jungles. Elsewhere is home to the feline race of humanoids known as the Khajiit. Sources say the Khajiit predate even the elves' arrival on the continent, making them one of Tamriel's truest natives along with the Argonians. In the southwest lies Valenwood, which became home to the wood elves before the first era began. Realizing the great forests were too wild to tame, the Wood Elves decided to adapt instead. In a pocket guide to the Empire, it describes Valenwood as a sea of endless green, a maze of foliage with half-hidden cities growing like blooms from a flower. The home of the Bosmer is Tamriel's garden. The Somerset Isles is the large island southwest of Tamriel's mainland, 
and it is believed to be the first province occupied by the Elves. The Somerset Isles will become most associated with the High Elves, and for being the heart and soul of the Aldmeri Dominion. When people think of the western province of Hammerfell, they think of the Alakir Desert and its human inhabitants, the Red Guards. Finding the Alakir Desert a poor place for a home, the Red Guards fleeing Yakuta built great port and trade cities along the coast of Hammerfell, where they enjoy lives filled with travel and adventure, sailing mostly for profit as mercenaries throughout Tamriel. It is said that the history of Tamriel begins in the northwest province of High Rock. It is here where the Adamantite Tower stands as a testament to a long forgotten age. High Rock might be home to the oldest structure in Tamriel, but it also serves as home to the Bretons, and more recently, the Orcs. The Bretons divide the province into multiple city-states and minor kingdoms, while the Orcs are happy to call Orsinium their home. And thusly, we arrive at the heart of Tamriel. In the ages to come, Cyrodiil will act as home to the Heartland High Elves, who were rumored to be the first humanoids to settle in this province. It was these elves that built the great centerpiece of Tamriel, the White Gold Tower. Tall and imposing, the White Gold Tower will become the ultimate seat of power in the centuries to follow. The Heartland High Elves, also known as the Aliads, bring about their own destruction by enslaving the humans that later came to the region. The result was the Slave Rebellion and the birth of the Imperial Race. Cyrodiil will carry on without the Aliads. In their place, the Imperials will sacrifice much in efforts to hold the heart of Tamriel. In the First Era, they will successfully repel an Akaveri invasion. In the Second, an arcane explosion of energy will shake the very foundations of Tamriel. This will spur the bloody faction wars, and later will crown Tiber Septim, ushering in a new empire. Rebellions, conspiracy, Daedra, you name it, blood finds its way to the heart of Tamriel. Despite its chaotic nature, to us Nern is above all a land of beauty, mystery, and adventure. The stage has been set, the pieces in place, but who is pulling the strings? We learned previously that Tamriel did not come about on its own, but rather was created by divine beings. It was the Aedra that gave part of themselves in the creation of Tamriel and Mundus, giving up a part of their power to become the bones of Nern. On the other hand, we have the divine beings that did not want any part in the creation of us mortals. The elves gave them the name of Daedra, which translates to mean, not our ancestors. The affairs of men and elves are constantly being trifled with, and the immortal Daedra are greatly to blame. The Daedra are the supernatural beings that reside in the plane of existence known as Oblivion. Daedra have a bad habit, and it's manifesting themselves within our mortal plane of Mundus to cause all sorts of mischief and chaos. The Daedra come in two main varieties. On one side of the spectrum, we see the Lesser Daedra. These Daedra can be summoned by talented sorcerers, or encountered serving their respective Daedric lords. Daedric princes, on the other hand, are the most powerful of the Daedra, and thus most commonly worshipped in Tamriel as gods, especially amongst the Dark Elves, whose society, culture, and even appearance has been heavily influenced by these mysterious beings. Contributing to their air of mystery, Daedric princes have no inherent gender. Although all are referred to as princes, Daedric lords seem to be capable of changing their form at will, a power that they love to exercise when fooling us silly mortals. What makes the races of men and elves so nervous about the Daedric Princes is their utter lack of a mortal sense of good and evil. There are 17 Daedric Princes known to us on Tamriel, and almost all of them seem to find entertainment and humor in turning us mortals into their little playthings. When dealing with the Daedra, one gets the distinct impression of being mused over, kind of like a man looking under an upturned rock wandering at the lives of the bugs, wiggling ignorantly in the dirt. As much as the Daedric Princes like to study us, 
we like to study them. Throughout Samriel's history, there have been many who have encountered these supernatural beings, and those who were allowed to live have returned with many stories to tell and powerful artifacts to abuse. Queen of Dawn and Dusk, Mother of the Rose, and Queen of the Night Sky. Azura maintains a constant female image in her dealings. Her sphere is that of Dusk and Dawn, the hidden magics in between the realms of Twilight. Azura's Plane of Oblivion is Moonshadow, where she lives in a rose palace. Legend says that Azura's realm is blindingly beautiful and colorful, complete with waterfalls, trees, and a city of silver. Azura is considered unique amongst Daedra because she is one of the few Daedric princes who consistently acts on the side of moral good. It is said that in her dealings, Azura has shown concern for the well-being of her mortal subjects, where in contrast, most of her Daedric brethren seem to view us mortals as mere pawns. The Daedric artifact bestowed upon Azura's most faithful is a soul gem that never yields. Azura's star has an almost unlimited capacity for souls, making it a highly sought after relic for mages and assassins alike. Prince of Plots, Deceiver of Nations, Queen of Shadows, and Goddess of Destruction. Boethia is depicted as both male and female. Her sphere is associated with deceit, conspiracy, secret plots of murder, assassination, treason, and the unlawful overthrow of authority. The realm of Boethia is the realm of oblivion created and ruled by, you guessed it, Boethia. This dark realm consists of stormy skies, volcanic islands, and lava seas. Among most scholars, Boethia is viewed as evil in the traditional sense of the word. She is often cited as using her followers for sports and entertainment. This Daedric Prince delights in death and destruction, and many mortals have suffered because of her influence. The Dark Elves on the other hand have a different view of Boethia, but we'll have to save that study for another time. There are not one, but three Daedric artifacts associated with this Daedric Prince of Deceit. The Ebony Male, Fearstruck, and Goldbrand. Each powerful in their own right, Boethia's artifacts have a knack for finding their way into the hands of mortals in key moments in history. Like their master, they crave change. Daedric Prince of Power, Conjuration, Wishes, and Bargains. Clavicus Vile is depicted as a small juvenile fellow with horns protruding from his forehead, and he is never far from his companion Barbus, who is a shapeshifter, usually appearing as a dog. Clavicus's Plain of Oblivion is an untamed countryside populated with deadly yellow Daedra. When he finds himself in our realm of Mundus, Clavicus Vile seeks out individuals who wish to acquire something, and by summoning him, he gives it to them. Nice fellow, you might be thinking. However, he is known to take back his deals at inopportune times, giving the summoner more than they bargained for. The mind of a Daedra is unknowable to us mortals, but we assume he does this for his own amusement. The Mask of Clavicus Vile is a helm which makes the wearer more popular wherever he or she might go. The Catch? Much like the other Daedric artifacts, Clavicus seems to retain ultimate control of it and may recall it back to oblivion without warning. And you can see how this can be a problem. Hermias Mora is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is the scrying of the tides of fate of past and of future. Unlike the other princes, Hermias Mora chooses not to take on a humanoid form. Rather, he appears only as a mass of tentacles and claws, or an all-seeing eye. An endless library of forbidden knowledge, Apocrypha, is Hermias Mora's plane of oblivion. The books found within the library all have black covers with no titles, and the library is haunted by ghosts cursed with a thirst for knowledge that they can never satisfy. Black books are the Daedric artifacts created by the Daedric Prince of Fate and Knowledge. Each book contains some matter of forbidden knowledge. Upon reading one, the reader is pulled from his mortal body and transported out of Mundus into Apocrypha. Most mortals are driven insane by this process, but those who successfully journey through Apocrypha are rewarded with powerful knowledge. Huntsman and Father of Man-Beasts Hercene is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is the hunt, the sport of Daedra, the great game, and the chase. 
he is typically portrayed as male, with a spear in one hand and the head of a beast in the other. Hercene is responsible for creating diseases which transform man into beast. He is the father to all werewolves, hunting at night and being hunted by day. Visitors to Hercene's Plain of Oblivion, the hunting grounds, described it as a realm of thick forests and open plains. If the horn of Hercene is heard there, beware. Hercene himself has arrived with his hunting pack of werewolves. Hercene has more than one artifact, but the most notable is the Savior's Hide, which he bestows on only the mightiest of hunters. Jigalag is the Daedric Prince of Order. He is rumored to be one of the most powerful Daedric Princes because he has taken into account every detail of the world and every action that has ever taken place, past and present. As a result, he views the concept of individuality as a mere illusion. There came a time when Jigalag became so powerful that the other Daedric Princes began to fear him, if that's even possible. The other Princes cursed Jigalag in the cruelest of ways. They transformed him into an illogical, insane, and unorderly madman. Henceforth, Jigalag became known as the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheagorath. His method? Irrelevant. His motives? Unknowable. The Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheagorath, is an enigma. His realm, the Shivering Isles, is known as the Madhouse. It is a place of light and dark, colorful insects and dreary landscapes. Much like the man himself, those adventurers unlucky enough to find themselves in the Shivering Isles quickly lose their minds. It was the champion that discovered Sheagorath was but one side of a greater coin. At the end of every era, Sheagorath would transform back into Jigalag, and as Jigalag, he would restore order to the Realm of Madness. After that, however, he would be transformed back into Sheagorath, who would spread madness upon the Realm once more. The champion is the one that ended this cycle by defeating Jigalag in one-on-one -on -one combat effectively separating Sheagorath and Jigalag into two separate princes. The most well-known artifact Sheagorath has contributed to the moral plane is the Wabajack. An infamous staff, the Wabajack can transform a creature into something else entirely. However, its results, like Sheagorath, are unpredictable to say the least. Keeper of the Sworn Oath and the Bloody Curse, Malakath is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is the patronage of the Spurned and ostracized. He is seen almost as a heretic amongst the other Daedric Princes. His fabled weapon, Scourge, is cursed and will cast any Daedra that touches it into oblivion. Malakath's story is a long one and has left scholars with much to debate. It is widely believed that Malakath was created when Bothea ate the Old Mary ancestor spirit, Trinamac. The remains of Trinamac were then transformed into the Daedric Prince we call Malakath. This leads to the birth of the orcish race, and as such, many orcs follow Malakath to this day. Malakath is considered to be a good Daedric Prince, at least among the orcs, because of his reverence for honor and duty. His spheres are destruction, change, revolution, energy, and ambition. Merun's Dagon is the foe of all mortal races, and he has attempted to conquer our realm of existence many times in the past. He differs from the other Daedric Princes in that he believes Tamriel is in fact a Plane of Oblivion, which is his by right. Dagon's actual Plane of Oblivion is known as the Deadlands. As the name suggests, they are barren wastelands consisting of blackened islands and seas of lava, much like Boethia's realm. In an event known as the Oblivion Crisis, Dagon's followers, the Mythic Dawn, attempted to merge the Deadlands and Tamriel into one realm. They would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that meddling hero of Kavach. Like so many failures before, Merun's Dagon was banished back to oblivion by Akatosh himself. Dagon has attributed two artifacts to the realm of Mundus. The first was an artifact more powerful than any weapon because it led to the events of the Oblivion Crisis. It was an unassuming book, Mysterium Xarxes. The second artifact is known to us as Mayroon's Razor, a deadly dagger capable of slaying any creature instantly. Web Spinner, Spider, and Anticipation of Vivek, Mafala is the Daedric Prince whose fear is obstructed to us mortals. Just as her nickname suggests, 
Mafala appears either male or female, depending on who she wishes to ensnare. Mafala sees the affairs of mortals as a weave. Pull but one thread, and the whole thing unravels. Like her other colleagues, she thoroughly enjoys playing with Mundus for her own amusement. Her realm, meanwhile, remains a complete mystery to us. Mafalia's artifact, the Ebony Blade, is indeed as dark and deadly as the mistress who empowers it. Every time the Ebony Blade strikes an opponent, part of the damage inflicted flows into the wielder as raw power. On a final note, Mafala is thought to have some deep roots in the Dark Brotherhood, but that, dear viewer, is a story for another day. Prince of Life and Lady of Infinite Energies, Meridia is a Daedric Prince we know very little about, except that she is associated with the energies of living things. Yes, she has a great and everlasting hatred for the undead, and will greatly reward any of those who erase them from this world. Because of this, most citizens of Tamriel view her as one of the good Daedric Princes. Meridia's artifact, the Ring of the Khajitai, became famous when it found itself in the hands of an infamous burglar who used its power of invisibility to become the single most successful burglar in elsewhere's history, which among the Khajiit is certainly saying something. Meridia's other known artifact is rightfully called Dawnbreaker, Scourge of the Undead. Meridia's power contributes to the blade by releasing a blast of energy that burns away all undead it touches. The king of rape and harvester of souls, Molag Bal is the Daedric prince whose sphere is the domination and enslavement of all mortals. His main desire is to harvest the soul of mortals and to bring them within his sway by spreading seeds of strife and discord in the mortal realms. One legend claims that Molag Bal raped a virgin, creating the first vampire, which gives him the name Father of Vampires. Molag's plane of oblivion is Cold Harbor, the book, The Doors of Oblivion, says that his plane resembles a copy of Nern, including the Imperial Palace, but all is desecrated and in ruin. The ground is sludge, the sky is on fire, and the air is freezing. The mace of Molag Bal represents its master well, by sucking the magical energies away from the victim and giving them to the wielder. The weapon is sometimes even referred to as the Vampire's Mace. Molag Bal attempted to bring his realm of Cold Harbor to the realm of Mundus in the Second Era. Much like Mehrunes Dagon did with his Oblivion Gates, Molag Bal tries to use his Dark Anchors to merge Tamriel and Oblivion into one. Luckily for living things everywhere, he fails in this endeavor. Even so, being a Daedric Prince he cannot be destroyed, and yet lives on. Spirit of the Daedra and Lady of Decay Namira is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is the ancient darkness, often associated with repulsive creatures like spiders, insects, slugs, and beggars. As a matter of speaking, Namira is credited for giving the beggaring gifts of disease, pity, and disregard. Namira's artifact is the aptly named Ring of Namira. With it, the wearer is compelled to feast on the dead, growing stronger with each corpse devoured. The Night Mistress, the Mistress of Shadows, the Unknowable, Daughter of Twilight, the Mistress of Mystery, and the Saint of Suspicion. Nocturnal is known by many names, but she has but one spear of night and darkness. As you'd imagine, worshippers of Nocturnal consist primarily of those who operate in darkness and night, such as thieves and spies. Although Nocturnal arguably has one of the largest cult followings of all the Daedric Princes, she has no form of organized clergy. As a matter of fact, Nocturnal seems to hold worship with little regard. Evergloom is the mysterious realm of Nocturnal, and seems to have a connection with the luck that thieves seem to enjoy. Nocturnal has two known artifacts that complement their master perfectly. The most infamous artifact is an enchanted cow that completely hides the wearer's identity from mortal knowledge. This isn't a mere burglar's mask. The cow's magic is so powerful that whomever possesses it is wiped from the tapestry of life. Close friends and even spouses can't recall the person's name. The second artifact grants its wielder special power as well as the ability to open any door, physical or otherwise. The skeleton key has found its way into many hands throughout history, and its impact here on Tanriel is undeniable. Known to some as the Taskmaster, Periite 
is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is Pestilence. It's pretty ironic that Periite is often depicted as a dragon-like being, considering he is one of the weakest of the Daedric Princes. Albeit labeling any Daedric Prince as weak is laughable. Indirectly, Periite has influenced the lives of nearly every mortal inhabitant on Nern. He is the Lord of Pestilence and the cause of many plagues and pandemic diseases. Periite's artifact is an enchanted shield, the Spellbreaker, which possesses the ability to reflect or absorb incoming magical attacks. Sanguine is the Daedric Prince of Debauchery. The citizens of Tamriel recognize his domain over the darker natures of man, such as lust, sin, gluttony, and greed. Although a joker in his own right, Sanguine prefers to drag mortals down to sinful lifestyles by means of temptation and humiliation. Sanguine's realms are a collection of 100,000 realms of oblivion, created and ruled over by this Daedric Prince of Indulgence. The realms are used mainly as pleasure pockets, and very little is known about them. Usually after performing some odd task, Sanguine will bestow his artifact to his champion. Sanguine's Rose is one of the most powerful summoning staffs to grace the realm of Mundus, capable of summoning a Dramora to aid the wielder in battle. Like fits of passion though, the Rose is a fleeting thing. Each time the Rose is used, it wilts a little, and when all the petals fall off, it loses its power. Somewhere in Oblivion, a new rose blooms and is plucked by Sanguine to be given to another champion. Vermina is the Daedric Prince whose sphere is the realm of dreams and nightmares. It is a realm where evil omens enter the mortal plane. Vermina's plane of Oblivion is called Quagmire, and those poor souls that have caught a glimpse of it describe it as a realm where nightmares are born. The Skull of Corruption is Vermina's signature artifact, it is a staff of dark magic that creates a mirror image of whoever it is cast upon. The image then attacks the victim at the behest of the caster. This isn't the worst it can do, however. Legend holds the staff has a mind of its own and can feed on the memories of those around it. The Daedric Princes have a great foothold in Tamriel, and whether we realize it or not, they've shaped our lives in more ways than we know. However, where there is night, there is day. Where there is darkness, there is light. We learned previously that dark supernatural forces are alive and well on Tamriel. The Daedric Princes are in large the embodiment of change and chaos. They seem to love stirring things up on Nern, which is pretty ironic, considering that they didn't attribute a single thing in its creation. It was their counterparts, the Aedra, who we owe our existence to as mortals. It was the Aedra who gave themselves in our creation, and it was the Aedra who became the bones of our planet. In the ancient Aldmeric tongue, Aedra translates to mean, our ancestors. Unlike the Daedra, the Aedra do not have their own immortal planes within oblivion. Rather, the act of creation bound them permanently to the mortal plane, so unlike the Daedra, the Aedra can in fact be killed, which is why there are some that consider them unworthy of worship. To the majority of Tamriel, however, the Aedra are revered as gods and are given the collective name, the Divines. These Aedra, having given much of their divine essence in the creation of Nern, cannot physically walk on the planet, but they are still believed to influence it in their own way. Worshippers of the Divines believe their destiny to be guided and protected by the Divines, and history has often proven them to be right. First born of the Aedra, Dragon God of Time and Chief Deity of the Nine Divines, Akatosh represents the qualities of endurance, invincibility, and everlasting legitimacy. Akatosh is considered to be the God Defender of the Empire. As Lord of the Aedra, Akatosh took pity on the plight of mortal man, who were slaves to the Daedra-loving Aeliads. Looking down on men, he drew precious blood from his own heart and blessed Saint Alasia with the blood of dragons, or as we know it, the Amulet of Kings. This ancient covenant sealed shut the jaws of oblivion long enough for Saint Alasia to free her people, ensuring the birth of an empire. 
In the province of Cyrodiil, Akatosh's main chapel is located in the city of Kavaj. At his chapels, he blesses his followers with increased magicka and speed. Akatosh tells us, Serve and obey your emperor. Study the covenants, worship the nine, do your duty, and heed the commands of the saints and priests. God of righteous might and merciful forbearance, Stendar is the inspiration of kings and rulers. He is the patron of the imperial legions and the comfort of the law-abiding citizen. In the wake of the Oblivion Crisis, followers of Stendar formed the organization known as the Vigilance of Stendar, whose sole mission is to eradicate the Daedra and their followers, no matter what their form. The Vigilance of Stendar wander the countryside looking to enforce justice. They're particularly fond of saying the words, May Stendar have mercy on you, for the Vigil has none to spare. This saying of theirs is pretty ironic considering that the self-proclaimed believers are supposed to be in service of the God of Mercy. The Chapel of Stendar is located in Cyrodelic Coral, and, according to legend, the Gauntlets of the Divine Crusader are located within. Stendar tells us, Be kind and generous to the people of Tamriel. Protect the weak, heal the sick, and give to the needy. God of the Cycle of Birth and Death Arche is associated with burials and funeral rites. Arche is thought to be the son of Akatosh, sometimes called the Mortals God. Arche is the great spirit who brings every man, elf, and beast into the world, and when he deems the time is right, he ends their cycle of life and death. Because of this, Arche is fertility and blight, joy and sorrow. Arke's main chapel is located in the Cyrodelic city of Chaden Hall, where he blesses pilgrims with increased fortitude. Arke tells us, Honor the earth, its creatures and spirits, living and dead. Guard and tend to the bounties of the mortal world, and do not profane the spirits of the dead. Goddess of Love, Mara is the patron of the bountiful earth, and the source of mortal compassion and understanding. In some writings, she is thought to be the wife of Akatosh. Chapels devoted to the mother goddess of Tamriel are called benevolences, because her followers are devoted to uniting all creatures as children of Mara. Her believers are intolerant to only those who show intolerance. They hate only those who hate. For a reasonable donation to a benevolence, the patron will be blessed and supposedly be forever beloved by he or she who loves them best. Mara tells us, Live soberly and peacefully, honor your parents and preserve the peace and security of home and family. God of work and commerce, the provider of ease and the trader god, Zenithar is the deity of wealth, labor, commerce, and man and Mer's most powerful gift, communication. Many followers of Zenithar have demonstrated that through earnest work and honest profit, not through war and bloodshed, peace and prosperity reign true. For the honest pilgrim, Zenithar will bestow a most prized weapon, a silver tongue. Zenithar tells us, Work hard and you will be rewarded. Spend wisely and you will be comfortable. Never steal or you will be punished. Among men, he is the greatest hero to ever walk the mortal plane. Talos is the god of war heir to the seat of the Sundered Kings, in Dragonborn. Tiber Septim's great deeds here on Nern were so legendary that he ascended to godhood as Talos, and the eight became nine. The story of Tiber Septim the Man is a long and profound one. He's arguably one of the most influential mortals who ever lived. His, his is a story we will surely return to time and again, but for now know that he was the one who brought about the dawn of an era when he conquered all of Tamriel bringing even the high and haughty elves to their knees. Unifying an entire continent, Tiber Septim crowned himself the first emperor of Tamriel, and at the ripe age of 108, he ascended to godhood as Talos, taking the divines from 8 to 9. It is important to note, however, that the matter of Talos's godhood is still a point of great debate, both in how and whether it actually happened. So, naturally, like any good Tamrielic debate, wars will be fought, 
and blood will be spilled. Talos tells us, be strong for war, be bold against enemies and evil, and defend the people of Tamriel. Deity of the heavens, the winds, the elements, and the unseen spirits of air, Kinnereth is the patron to sailors and travelers. In some legends, she is the first of the Aedra to agree to Lorcan's plan to invent the mortal plane of Mundus, and provides the space for its creation. It is said that Kinnereth took pity on the plight of man and gifted them with a thum so that they could harness the language of dragons to use its power against them to save themselves from the wrath of Alduin. Pilgrims seeking Kinnereth's blessing receive the gift of heightened stamina. Kinnereth tells us, Use nature's gifts wisely, respect her power, and fear her fury. She has nearly a dozen different cults some devoted to women, some to artists, and others to erotic instruction. Tabella is the goddess of beauty and love. Houses of worship dedicated to her are sometimes called Houses of Tabella, though like most places of worship, they are also referred to as chapels and temples. Tabella tends to attract individuals who live life in pursuit of sensual pleasure. Worshipping Dabella is thought to be as a more personal and intimate association than worshipping the other divines. Cyrodiil's Chapel of Dabella resides in Anvil. Prayers heard by Dabella within the chapel fortify personality. Dabella tells us, Open your heart to the noble secrets of art and love. Treasure the gifts of friendship. Seek joy and inspiration in the mysteries of love. God of Wisdom and Logic Julianos is the father of language, mathematics, literature, law, history, and contradiction. He is usually associated with magic, and thus often revered by wizards. Orders dedicated to Julianos are the keepers of the mysterious Elder Scrolls. Julianos tells us, Know the truth. Observe the law. When in doubt, seek wisdom from the wise. As citizens of Tamriel, our everyday existence is a living testament to the Aedra. So what is it? Daedra or Aedra? What side do you fall on? We learned previously that the denizens of Tamriel are an ambitious and diverse people. However, our lives are not of our own making. Every breath we breathe and every step we take is a living testament to the Divine Aedra, who sacrificed much so that we might exist. What do we do with their sacrifice? We plot a course for our future. Whether that entails living life for gold, flesh, or the greater good, us mortals quickly learned that if you want to achieve something in life, you have to seek strength in numbers. If one has a goal, that goal is best reached on the shoulders of like-minded individuals, i.e. guilds. Guilds are professional organizations made up of members who share a specific skill set or vision. Dozens if not hundreds of guilds have been established throughout Tamriel's history, but our focus will be on those guilds that have achieved lasting greatness. Guilds that not only have stood for centuries, but have extended their reach to every corner of Tamriel. Never steal from another member of the guild. Never kill anyone on the job. And don't steal from the poor. Whoever said there is no honor amongst thieves has never been awarded membership into the inconspicuous thieves guild. In truth, the guards and authorities of the land would have you believe that the thieves guild is a myth. After all, how can a group of ruffians assemble anything resembling the organization of a guild? You would be surprised. Like any trade guild, the thieves guild is an organization of professionals, and in this case, those professionals are burglars, bandits, pickpockets, smugglers, and fences. Although criminal by its very definition, at its best the Thieves' Guild is a highly organized group of like-minded individuals. Those thieves with the discipline to follow the Guild's simplistic founding principles reap the rewards of combined collaboration. When a thief is in need of quick coin, she goes to her guild for a contract. Say what you will. But the people of Tamriel are far from honest. 
because the Thieves Guild is never in need of work. There are valuables to be stolen, ledgers that need forging, pockets that need fishing, and doors that need picking. In a world of politics and dirty business, the Thieves Guild keeps its coffers full. As previously stated, the structures of the guild is clear cut. Members of the Thieves Guild are able to rise through the ranks from lowly pickpocket to master thief. Unlike most guilds, however, eligibility for advancement doesn't depend on how well you stick out. On the contrary, advancement is rewarded for your ability to go unnoticed. Your reputation for subtlety will grant you higher rank. With higher rank comes riskier contracts, and with riskier contracts comes even greater reward. Don't let their grimy exteriors fool you. The more talented Shadowfoots of the Thieves Guild are very, very rich men and women. To this day it is said, if you really want to know something, go ask the beggars. They have eyes and ears throughout the cities. They know all the little secrets of the daily lives of its citizens. The third rule of the Thieves Guild protects the peasants and beggars. It is a mutually beneficial arrangement that has served the guild quite well. The guild and its guild master, the Great Fox, protect the beggars and the poor from authority. In turn, the beggars become the eyes and ears of the guild. Beggars from all corners of Tamriel gather information and become spies for the Thieves Guild. Because of this, a priceless artifact does not move from one place to another without the guild catching wind of it. Despite the nature of their organization, the Thieves Guild has a good working relationship with the local authorities. The guild knows the power of coin better than anyone, and their coin goes into the pockets of those government officials smart enough to look the other way. In this manner, things went well for the guild. That was until the Third Era, when a man named Hieronymus Lex got promoted to Captain of the Watch in the guild's most lucrative area, the Imperial City. Hieronymus Lex had a personal vendetta against the Thieves' Guild and its leader, the Grey Fox. Hieronymus Lex attempted to capture members of the Thieves' Guild, and his life's ambition was to uncover the secret of the Grey Fox. After all, by wearing the infamous Grey Cowl of Nocturnal, the man behind the cowl was a myth. Through skill and cunning, not through violence and assassination, the Thieves Guild eventually removed Hieronymus Lex from Captain of the Watch and were able to operate freely once again. Now unhindered, the Guild's influence grew drastically in the centuries to follow. Hard times would come again though during the Fourth Era, this time in the form of bad luck. Skyrim's chapter of the Thieves Guild was arguably one of the most influential in the Nine Provinces. As a matter of fact, the guild operates quite freely in Skyrim and are left alone because of the pool that they have in government. Not to mention, it's rumored that the Thieves Guild of Riften has a solid working relationship with the notorious Dark Brotherhood. Despite their vast connections, as it turns out the guild's success in Skyrim was all thanks to their strong ties with the Night Mistress herself. Thanks to Nocturnal's blessing, the Thieves Guild of Riften benefited from the leadership of her fiend Nightingales. Their ties with the Daedric Prince ensured that the Thieves Guild of Riften was something special. Its thieves were one with the shadows and experienced an uncanny amount of luck. Hard times befall the guild when Nocturnal's artifact, the Skeleton Key, is stolen by a Nightingale who was sworn to protect it. As Nocturnal's blessing faded away, so did the guild's treasury. The Thieves' Guild quickly became but a shadow of its former glory. That was, until the Nightingales corrected the wrong by slaying the renegade Nightingale and returning the Skeleton Key to its rightful place in Nocturnal's realm of Oblivion, Ebonmir. By restoring their favor with the Daedric forces that be, the Nightingales brought about a golden age for the Thieves' Guild. It's pretty interesting, no matter which part of history we look at, Nocturnal's hand seems to be at work in the lives of those who make their living in the shadows, and thanks to her alliance with the Thieves' Guild, the citizens of Tamriel lock their doors at night. The Fighters' Guild is a brotherhood of warriors. We provide a service to Tamriel lending steel and shield to those who need our help. Whether that means ridding a town of an invading menace or protecting a helpless mage, 
We'll take the contract. The Fighters Guild is an organization chartered by the Emperor himself to regulate the hiring and training of mercenaries throughout the Empire's territories. The Guild was founded back in the Second Era, year 321, and since then it has been in the business of slaying trolls, eliminating bandit hideouts, safe delivery of goods, and escorting. When you're in need of muscle and have the septums to boot, the Fighters Guild gets the job done. The Fighters Guild does not stand on ceremony, and rising through their ranks depends on whether you fulfill or default on a contract. The former will see you up the ladder to the esteemed rank of champion. The latter will not only ensure you don't get paid, but it will lose you rank. Default on too many contracts, and you risk expulsion from the guild. After all, like any guild, this guild's continued survival depends solely on its reputation for successfully fulfilling contracts. The guild has been known to suffer from corruption problems in the higher ranks, particularly in Morrowind. The guild there performs private contracts, but sometimes deals with disreputable groups. Despite these flaws, the Marwin Guild near the end of the Third Era succeeded in providing some of the only concrete evidence of the existence of the mysterious Thieves Guild. In Cyrodiil, the Fighters Guild thrived for centuries. That was until the time of the Oblivion Crisis, when they were faced with strong competition from another mercenary guild known as the Blackwood Company. At this period in history, the mercenaries of the Blackwood Company were rumored to be the best fighters in all the land. Their warriors, who fought with unfathomable strength, were comprised mostly of Khajiit and Argonians. Quickly losing their reputation, the Fighters Guild found itself in need of contracts, a position a guild never wants to be in. The members of the Fighters Guild took it upon themselves to launch investigations, trying to get the upper hand on their competitor. By infiltrating the Blackwood Company with one of their own, the Fighters Guild found something truly unexpected. The mercenaries of the company were outstanding fighters, but it had little to do with their skill. In the basement of their headquarters, the Blackwood Company was growing a history imported from Argonia. Sap from a history has very powerful effects on the ones who drink it, including superhuman strength. However, for anyone who isn't an Argonian, Hist sap causes hallucinations, often throwing the user into a blood rage. While under the influence of the sap, members of the Blackwood Company couldn't tell friend from foe, and many innocent lives have been lost to this effect. After the discovery, the Fighters Guild put a quick end to this injustice by destroying the Hist, effectively destroying the Blackwood Company in the process. Now the only business in town, the Guild's influence grew, and to this day, the Fighters Guild is a thriving organization full of well-paid mercenaries. The idea of a collection of mages, sorcerers, and assorted mystics pooling their resources and talents for the purpose of research and public charity was a revolutionary concept in the early years of the Second Era. Dedicated to the study of the arcane, the Mages Guild was founded by the Empire to educate Tamriel's gifted in the proper use of Magicka. The Guild is led by an Archmage who in turn is guided by his Council of Mages. Located in the heart of Tamriel itself, the Arcane University acts as the Guild's headquarters and center of learning. Here, Mages from across Tamriel would journey to safely learn how to harness magic. Schools of magic that are especially dangerous, such as Conjuration, must be closely supervised by master wizards at the college. There are seven arcane disciplines approved and taught by the Mages Guild. Mysticism is the school of manipulating magical forces and boundaries to bypass the structures and limitations of the physical world. The practice of mysticism gives the caster access to spells like telekinesis, life detection, and soul trapping for the use of soul gems. Restoration is the school of mending, and due to its generous nature, the school of restoration is the most widely accepted school of magic the guild offers. The study of restoration gives the caster the ability to use spells like cure disease, healing, and wards which absorb magical blows and physical blows from aggressors. Alteration 
is another school that involves manipulation of the physical world and its natural properties. Proficiency in alteration is highly sought after, and it has everything to do with transmuting iron into silver, and silver into lucrative gold. It's safe to say that he who masters the school of alteration never wants for wine. Destruction is, well, the school of destroying things. Destruction spells harm living and undead creatures alike, and mages specializing in destruction usually serve in standing armies. Destruction spells usually involve melting the skin off of the bodies of other living things. Conjuration is the school of summoning. Since conjuration mostly involves the summoning of Daedra from the plains of oblivion, mages practicing conjuration are treated with great suspicion by most citizens of Tamriel, and this goes double for the Nords, who often treat conjurers with open hostility. The school of illusion encompasses spells that affect the minds of living things. Through changing the perceptions of their subjects, master illusionists can hide in plain sight, bolster morale, and even calm the most hostile of aggressors. Through the mastery of illusion, beggars become kings, and enemies become friends. As you'd imagine, manipulating the minds of men and myrrh is a highly sought after talent. The alchemy discipline is the processing and refinement of ingredients and materials through the arcane processes to elicit and preserve their subtle hidden magical effects into alchemical potions. Selling potions to the sick and weary of Tamriel funds the Mages Guild and keeps them in good standing with the powers that be. As written in numerous history books, the founder of the Mages Guild is Vanus Galerian. Before the founding of the Mages Guild, however, he was an apprentice to the Sigix in the Somerset Isles. Vanus Galerian and another Altmer by the name of Manamarco were amongst the brightest apprentices in the mysterious Arcane Order. However, they were two very different wizards. Manamarco enjoyed practicing necromancy, while Galerian despised the practice of stirring the restful dead. Furthermore, Manamarco exceeded his grasp by using magic for his personal gain. During the Second Era, Manamarco forged a dark pact with the Tharn family by resurrecting their fallen Imperial soldiers. Secretly, Manamarco was conspiring with Molag Bal the Daedric Prince of Domination, and by resurrecting the fallen soldiers, Manamarco was supplying Molag Bal with an undead army. When the Council of Sigix refused to intervene, Galarian decided to create an arcane guild of his own to face the evil ways of Manamarco. The Mage's Guild was born. Although Manamarco would ultimately fail, he was never truly defeated. Centuries later, Manamarco would return to plague the Mages Guild in the Third Era as the King of Worms and Master of Necromancers. Here, he would fail yet again in his endeavor to destroy the Guild. Manamarco wouldn't be the one to bring about the Guild's destruction. After the devastating effects of the Oblivion Crisis, the citizens of Tamriel were desperately looking for someone to blame. Since the followers of Mayrun's Dagon were primarily magic users, the public blamed mages everywhere for the catastrophe. Sadly, the mages' guild would never recover from their battered reputation, and thusly was dissolved. Although the practice of magic didn't cease in the other corners of Tamriel, the gates of the arcane university were closed. Whether it's a guild made up of lowly pickpockets or lofty sages, a guild lives and dies by its reputation. A guild needs to be respected or feared to survive. Preferably both. best understand the history of this ancient order, dear brother, you have to understand how this cult of assassins came about. The Dark Brotherhood has been mixing murder with business for centuries, bringing a swift death to even the mightiest of emperors. The story of their origins, however, starts much earlier. In fact, to understand their story, you have to go back to before the beginning. 
Back to a time before men and elves bloodied Tamriel with their wars, before Daedra ignited chaos, before Aedra assisted in the creation of our planet. For before there was time and space, there was the Void. Simply put, the Void is a cosmic realm of utter nothingness. This is the domain of Sithis. In Dark Brotherhood lore, Sithis and the Void were present before all things. Who is Sithis, you ask? Some call him the Dread Father. It was his terrible love that gave birth to the Dark Brotherhood so very long ago. Know this. Sithis is neither Aedra or Daedra. According to ancient writings, Sithis predates the creation of both groups. Because of this, the Dark Brotherhood worships Sithis as the one true god, the one who existed before all others. It was in fact his chaotic nature that caused the reaction, that led to the birth of the Aedra and the Daedra, and the Aedra later created Mundus and in turn Tamriel. Yes, Sithis was the spark that ignited creation. The Dark Brotherhood often depicts Sithis as a skeleton, due to his association with death. However, some say he is as formless as the void he represents. Sithis is considered the embodiment of everything evil, but at the same time he is described as being nothing at all, a void. Sithis is appeased through death and other acts of suffering and strife. He brought about our existence after all, and what is existence if not a conduit for suffering? living each day for survival. The Dark Brotherhood may call him father, but Sithis is a father not many would keep. Even so, Sithis is revered in the Brotherhood, and accredited for bringing the Cult of Assassins into existence through his prophet, the Night Mother. The Night Mother is the Dark Brotherhood's unholy matron. She guides our actions, just as the Dread Father Sithis once guided hers. According to Dark Brotherhood legend, Sithis visited a Dark Elf woman in her bedchamber and begot her five children. Two years passed as the children grew older. One night the Dark Elf woman heard the voice of Sithis. Sithis wished to be reunited with his children, but he needed her help. That fateful night, she murdered her children and sent their souls straight to the void, straight to their father. When they learned about what the Dark Elf woman had done, the people of the village rallied against the woman, for such an act was considered incomprehensible. In one night of vengeance, they descended upon the woman, killing her and burning down the house in which the atrocity took place. And that was the end of the story. Or so everyone thought. A little more than 30 years later, a man heard a strange, comforting voice inside his head. Just as the Dark Elf woman claimed to hear the voice of Sithis inside hers. The voice identified herself as the Night Mother and named the man Listener. The first of many. Sweet mother, sweet mother, send your child unto me, for the sins of the unworthy must be baptized in blood and fear. All across the Empire, every day, people beseech the Night Mother, and through the power of Sithis, the Night Mother hears their prayers for murder. The Night Mother speaks to only one member of the Dark Brotherhood, the Listener of the Black Hand. And when Our Lady speaks, death follows. The position of Listener is the highest rank a Dark Brotherhood assassin could ever hope to achieve. The Listener is the only member of the Dark Brotherhood who can hear the voice of the Night Mother, who speaks for Sithis, so being chosen as a Listener is a sacred honor. Aside from communing with the Night Mother, the Listener also leads the Black Hand. The Black Hand is the ruling body of the Dark Brotherhood. It is made up of one Listener and four speakers. Four fingers and a thumb, if you will. Unlike lesser organizations like the Morag Tong, the Dark Brotherhood's assassins seem to be everywhere at once, and this is attributed to the Speakers of the Black Hand. Each speaker operates her own Dark Brotherhood sanctuary. Sanctuaries are the Dark Brotherhood safe houses scattered throughout Samriel. Here members of the guild find rest in between manhunts. While in a sanctuary, members of the Dark Brotherhood train in the arts of stealth and assassination, often exchanging fighting techniques. 
since the sanctuary is run by a speaker who is in direct communication with the listener, and in turn Sithis, this is also the place where members pick up assassination contracts. Once a citizen of Tamriel has been marked by the Dark Brotherhood, there is nowhere left to hide. The Dark Brotherhood will send as many assassins as it takes until the contract is carried out, and the soul of their victim is sent screaming to the void. And thusly we arrive at the lifeblood of the Dark Brotherhood, the murderers and cutthroats. Despite the fact that the Dark Brotherhood operates more like a cult than an actual guild, its lower ranking members must still follow a very strict set of rules. These rules are handed down by the Night Mother herself to keep her children safe. The Five Tenants The Five Tenants are as follows. Tenants 1. Never dishonor the Night Mother. To do so is to invoke the wrath of Sithis. Tenant 2. Never betray the Dark Brotherhood or its secrets. To do so is to invoke the wrath of Sithis. Tenant 3. Never disobey or refuse to carry out an order from a Dark Brotherhood superior. To do so is to invoke the wrath of Sithis. Tenet 4. Never steal the possessions of a dark brother or dark sister. To do so is to invoke the wrath of Sithis. Tenet 5. Never kill a dark brother or dark sister. To do so is to invoke the wrath of Sithis. They had already been operating in the shadows for centuries, and now the Dark Brotherhood was ready to show Tamriel just how far their black hand could reach. In the Third Era, Year 41, Tiber Septim's heir Pelagius I was assassinated while praying to Akatosh in the Temple of the One. The Dark Brotherhood left their calling card, and it was that day that the whole of Tamriel learned to fear what they believed to be the single most powerful guild to ever plague Mundus. Anyone can kill, but to kill an emperor, one who is anointed by Akatosh himself, that is the work of gods. After the assassination of Pelagius I, the Dark Brotherhood's influence grew drastically, especially in the regions of High Rock and Hammerfell, where they had a safe house in almost every town and city. By commanding fear, the void would swell with souls as the Dark Brotherhood carried out countless assassinations for almost 400 years. Trouble would eventually emerge from the inside of the shadowy organization when a vampire member named Greywin claimed to hear the voice of Sithis. Greywin began a crusade against the Dark Brotherhood, purging it of all non-vampire members. Vampires have always made up a sizable portion of the Dark Brotherhood. Their dark gifts of agility make them particularly suitable for stalking prey. Greywin saw himself as the purest of life takers, so he started an organization out of the Dark Brotherhood and coined it the Crimson Scars. His attempt at reformation failed when a member of the Crimson Scars betrayed him to the Black Hand, who swiftly retaliated and murdered the Crimson Scars. The ultimate fate of Greywin and his supposed sanctuary remains unknown to this day. After recovering from the Crimson Scars, the Dark Brotherhood believed that they were ready to take on the only people dangerous enough to call their rivals, the Molrag Tong. By attempting to gain a foothold in Vardenfell, the Brotherhood were encroaching on the territory long serviced by the Molrag Tong, an assassin's guild even older than the Brotherhood itself. Their aggressive expansion was repelled fiercely by the Tong, effectively pushing the Dark Brotherhood out of Vardenfell. The Dark Brotherhood did not go quietly, however. Before their retreat, they promptly assassinated the leader of the Morag Tong. Although the rest of Tamriel's was theirs for the taking, Vardenfell belonged to the Morag Tong. The Dark Brotherhood will go on to encounter many more threats. At the closing of the Third Era, they will near extinction when they are infiltrated by an assassin of assassins. The Dark Brotherhood did recover but only to be thrown into chaos again when the Great War ravaged their sanctuaries. However, they are never pulled out from the roots, and like a weed, the Dark Brotherhood always manages a comeback. Dear Brother, 
only Sethis really knows what is in store for this cult of misfits, but this one suspects that evil always finds a way. Tamriel prays and the Void answers. Sithis indirectly brought the denizens of Tamriel into existence. Does he not have the right to take us out again? Even if that means death at the hands of a Dark Brotherhood assassin. Most civilized cultures actively disregard Sithis and his Dark Brotherhood. Most cultures. Not all. Every province of Tamriel has its secret histories, but no land in the Empire is as undocumented and unexplored as Black Marsh. Bordering Morrowind to the north and Cyrodiil to the west, Black Marsh, also known as Argonia, is one of the most inhospitable locations in Tamriel. The water-soaked landscape gives way to dense swampland, which is teeming with flesh-eating insects, poisonous plants, and disease. It has been called the garbage heap of Tamriel, to where everything rotten and despoiled eventually flows. But for those resilient enough to live there, there is a dangerously alluring beauty to be found within its borders. The original natives of Black Marsh, and maybe even Tamriel, are as mysterious as the province itself. That's because these ancient natives are a species of sentient trees that grow in the heart of Argonia, the Hist. The Argonians will tell you that the Hist are more ancient than all the mortal races, older than the oppressive elves, and surely older than the hot-headed races of men. The Hist have existed since time immemorial, and their connection with the Argonians runs deeper than any root. Very little is known, and even less is understood, about the reptilian denizens of Black Marsh. Years of defending their borders have made the Argonians experts in guerrilla warfare, and their natural abilities make them equally at home in water as on land. They are well suited for the treacherous swamps of their homeland, and have developed natural immunities to diseases and poisons that have doomed many would-be adventurers into the region. They are, in general, a reserved people, slow to trust and hard to know. Yet. They are fiercely loyal and will fight to the death for those they have named friend. While Argonians appear reptilian in nature, they also exhibit qualities of fish and amphibians. They are able to breathe underwater through small gills behind their ears and swim using the same method as that of a tadpole or eel, moving their tail side to side to propel them through the water. Argonian appearance ranges from reptilian to almost human. This is caused by the hist sap that they ingest as hatchlings, which ceremonially takes place on their naming day. Speaking of ceremony, the Argonians revere the hist with an almost religious vigor. When the sap of a hist is consumed, the tree is capable of communicating with the Argonian through visions, and beyond that it also rewards Argonian guerrilla fighters with heightened combat prowess. When forced to defend their homeland, the Argonians depend on the Hist, and the Hist depend on them in turn. The relationship between tree and humanoid does not stop there. The Argonians apparently believe that the Hist have given them their souls, and when they die, their souls are returned to the Hist to be reincarnated into a new Argonian. Because of their relationship, it is understandable why the Argonians are so protective of the Hist. They not only depend on the Hist in this life, but according to them, they also depend on the Hist in the next life. While we're on the topic of life and death, it is important to note that the Hist acknowledge Sithis as their master. In the Argonian homeland of Black Marsh, those born under the sign of the shadow are taken at birth and presented to the Dark Brotherhood. A shadow scale hatchling is trained in the arts of stealth and assassination and lives a life in service to the mighty kingdom of Argonia. The history of the Argonian people is dark and shrouded in many mysteries. Before the interfering races of men and myrrh, the Argonians were isolationists. Almost nothing is known about their activities until well into the First Era, when Black Marsh had the misfortune of attracting pirates 
who wished to use the coasts of Argonia as a base to attack rich merchant groups in eastern Cyrodiil. At the time, the rulers of the White Gold Tower were the Imperials of the First Empire, former human slaves of the Heartland High Elves. In response to the pirate raids being launched from the coasts, the Imperials invaded Black Marsh to put a stop to the illegal activity. Simple enough, but what they weren't counting on were the highly organized Argonians who undermined their efforts at every turn. Although the Imperials meant the Argonians no harm, the Argonian people regarded all outsiders as hostile invaders. It's pretty hard to blame them for this mindset though, considering the only humans the Argonian had encountered up to this point were the pirates who had tried killing them. Clearly, the Imperials felt unwelcomed in Black Marsh, and as quickly as they came, they departed. The Argonian people will not be brought into the Imperial fold until a year after their defeat at what is called the Battle of Argonia, which took place about a century later. Even with an Imperial yoke, Black Marsh proved far too wild to tame, and the Empire was only able to govern the outskirts of the Swampland. It was considered suicide, even for the Empire to try and penetrate Argonia's harsh interior, home of the Hist. Imperial occupation in parts of Black Marsh went on for centuries. That was until a mysterious and lethal flu broke out which killed virtually every non-reptilian race in Black Marsh. In the blink of an eye, the Argonians and the Hist had Black Marsh to themselves once again. The true origin of the disease remains a mystery to this day. After the pandemic, the Argonians enjoyed the peace of isolation, but it was short-lived. When the Daedric Prince, Molog Bal, sought to make Tamriel burn in the Second Era, even the reserved Argonians were forced to lend their swords in the fight for Tamriel's survival. In an effort to avert the crisis, the Argonians reluctantly pledged their blades to the Ebonheart Pact, where they used their natural abilities to serve as scouts and skirmishers. After this crisis was over, most Argonians were glad to live life in the swamps again, where they would hopefully be left alone. They should have learned by now that in Tamriel, a life without interference is a pipe dream at best. At the dawn of the Third Era, a man by the name of Tiber Septim came riding in with his Imperial Legions, ushering in his empire. And if there's anything we know about empires, it's that membership is not optional. Saying Tiber Septim conquered Black Marsh is a bit of an overstatement. He gained control of the borders and major cities along the coast, but Tiber Septim was a wise military strategist. He knew what it would mean to face the Argonians in the heart of their homeland. Even as the Dragonborn, with an army at his back, facing the Argonians would mean certain death. So rather, Tiber Septim decided to avoid the inner swamps altogether he met with little resistance from the Argonians. I suspect that at this point in history, the Argonians and the Hist knew the human races pretty well. After all, they had fought alongside the Nords in the Pact. As long as men controlled the outer rims of Black Marsh, their people were left alone. Besides, the Argonians had a much bigger problem on the horizon. The treacherous Dark Elves. Having served with the Dark Elves side by side as comrades in the Ebonheart Pact centuries earlier, you would think that tensions between the two races would be minimal. Unfortunately for the Argonians, the very traits that enabled them to survive so well in the swamps of their homelands also made them ideal slaves for hard labor in the regions of Morrowind. After having spilled blood together, some houses of Morrowind still managed to justify the enslavement of entire tribes of Argonians. Despite the disgust and frustration, of many people throughout Tamriel. In time, the Argonians will seek their revenge on their elven masters, but that, dear viewer, is a story for another day. It is a land whose ancient history is as dark and shrouded as its ash-filled skies. Morrowind is the province in the northeast corner of Tamriel, but if you were to journey there, you would have a hard time believing you were still in Tamriel. The familiar plant and wildlife of the other provinces is exchanged for the bizarre and twisted life forms 
that can survive the unrelenting ash storm sent forth from the mighty volcano that dominates the island of Vardenfell. Yes, Morrowind is an unforgiving place, and even if you were determined enough to endure the choking ashfall from Red Mountain, you'd still have to endure its inhabitants. Dark Elves, also known as Dunmer in the language of the Altmer, are the red-eyed peoples of Morrowind. Their ash-colored skin complements their environment perfectly, and it is this characteristic that lends them the name Dark Elves. Both male and female Dunmer have a height similar to most of the human races. This means that they are slightly taller than their Wood Elf cousins, but shorter than the lofty High Elves. The Dark Elves tend to live very long lives, even for the Elves. A Dunmer living to the ripe old age of 300 is not unheard of. This makes the Dark Elves of Morrowind the most long-lived race of mortals on Tamriel. On the battlefield, Dunmer are noted for their balanced integration of sword, bow, and magic. As an elven race, the Dark Elves boast powerful intellects and agile physiques. Like their elven counterparts, Dunmer grasp the arcane arts with ease, but beyond that, they have a special gift for the Destruction School of Magic. Almost every Dark Elf you'll come across can melt your face off if provoked. Their people produce some of the most skilled spell swords in all of Tamriel. When dealing with the other races of Tamriel, Dark Elves take Elven arrogance to the extreme. High Elves might regard the younger races of man and beast as foolish children, but in Dunmer culture, Elven supremacy has reached incredible heights. As a society, the Dark Elves view humans as no better than beasts, fit only for servitude. Slavery is a very real reality in Morrowind, and the great houses that govern the land, such as House Telvanni, have been practicing slavery for centuries. They are particularly fond of Khajiit and Argonian slaves who do well in their harsh environments. Needless to say, the Dark Elves are not popular with the other races of Tamriel, and I think they rather like it that way. Theirs is a nation that is fiercely independent. The Dark Elves are often seen as proud, clannish, ruthless, and even cruel. As a culture, the Dark Elves greatly value loyalty and family. According to the Dark Elves, the spirits of their dead relatives remain here on Nern in the afterlife. They believe these spirits guide their future with an invisible hand. Strong warrior spirits are thought to preserve the honor and wisdom of the entire race, even from beyond the grave. The Dunmer honor their ancestral spirits by building family shrines and offering up gifts as sacrifices. The oldest of the great ancestor spirits are thought to be the Daedra. Historically speaking, the Dunmer have resisted worshipping the Aedra altogether. Instead of following the Nine Divines, the Dark Elves choose to worship the Daedra and the teachings of the Tribunal Temple. Where the rest of the Empire actively shuns and even discriminates Daedra worshippers, Morrowind welcomes such practices with open arms. After all, without Daedric influences, we would not have Dark Elves on Tamriel. The story of how the Dunmer came to reside in Morrowind is one of revelation and rebirth. You see, before they were the Dark Elves we see before us today, they were no different from the High Elves of the Somerset Isles, contently worshipping the Aedra. That was until the Daedric Prince of Plots, Boethia, did what Daedra do best, enact change. Boethia's influence sparked a revolution amongst the Elves of Somerset. The result was an exodus to the east, to Morrowind, which led to the birth of a new culture on Tamriel. Although these exiled elves were physically indistinguishable from the Altmer of Somerset, they were given the name Chimer. To make a long and bloody story short, when the Chimer reached Morrowind, they discovered it was already home to a race of elves who called themselves the Dwemer. And although the two societies managed to coexist at first, cultures have a way of rubbing together. The result is often quite violent. The Battle of Red Mountain was a great battle fought between the Dwemer and the Chimer to decide the fate of Morrowind. It is probably one of the most significant battles ever fought on Tamrielic soil, yet thanks to conflicting reports, history has forgotten what actually took place. All we know for certain is that that battle ended with the disappearance 
of the Dwemer race, an entire race gone in the blink of an eye, and out of the ashes came the Chimer. But they were different. When the ash settled, the elves who remained were no longer the golden-skinned elves who left Somerset all those years ago. Their eyes were piercing red, their skin gray. Henceforth, Tamriel would call them Dark Elves. What caused the disappearance of an entire race and the transformation of another? What force is powerful enough to change the course of history itself? Some will tell you that only the Elder Scrolls themselves wield such power, and they'd be wrong in this case. We learned previously about a god named Lorcan, who convinced the Aedra to help in the creation of Tamriel and Mundus. Lorcan's heart, the heart of a god, has resided here on Tamriel ever since, simply waiting to be found. Three legendary Chimer, referred to as the Tribunal, found themselves in the possession of this powerful artifact, and with it, they are thought to have ended the Dwemer in one foul swoop. The Chimer saw their new heroes, this Tribunal, as their saviors. Now they prayed to the Daedra during their struggle with the Dwemer, but they did not answer. The Tribunal did. And so it was, the Chimer saw the Tribunal as gods amongst mortals, their new gods. Looking down on the Chimer in disgust, the Daedric Prince Azura cursed the Chimer. Henceforth, the Chimer would walk Tamriel, transformed as Dark Elves. While most of the local governance of the province continued through the great houses of Morrowind, the Dark Elves came to worship the Tribunal, following their teachings religiously. For thousands of years, the Tribunal used their power and leadership to protect the Dunmer from foreign invasion. When the Daedric Prince, Molog Bal, sought to make Tamriel burn in the Second Era, the Tribunal was ready to face the threat head-on. Being more attuned to the magical forces on Tamriel, the Tribunal had an important part to play. In an effort to avert the crisis, the Dark Elves reluctantly gave up their Argonian slaves and pledged their blades to the Ebonhar Pact, where they used their natural abilities to serve as skillful sorcerers. After the crisis was averted, the Dark Elves fell back into their old traditions. Now comes the dawning of the Third Era, when a man by the name of Tiber Septum came riding in with his Imperial Legions. Due to inner conflicts at the time, the Tribunal elected to sign a treaty with Tiber Septum's empire that made Morrowind an autonomous province, free to practice religion and tradition. Although this treaty still allowed the Dunmer to deal in human trafficking, Tiber Septim agreed to the terms. After all, he was a wise military strategist. Tiber Septim knew trying to free slaves would disrupt long-standing Dunmer tradition, so instead of facing the powerful tribunal head-on, he settled with an armistice. The centuries following Tiber Septim's reign were not good for the Dark Elves. At the closing of the Third Era, their sacred tribunal were overthrown by Daedric influences. Morrowind's greatest weapon, the Heart of Lorcan, was destroyed. Suddenly, the Dark Elf way of life was in peril, and to make matters worse, another Daedric Prince was on the move against them. During the chaos of the Oblivion Crisis, Mayrun's Dagon did not spare the Dark Elves. As wave after wave of Daedra came pouring in through the Great Oblivion Gates, the Dunmer suffered greatly, but ultimately won the day. After fighting in crisis after crisis, the Dark Elves thought they had escaped with their lives. They were gravely mistaken. While the Dark Elves were still licking their wounds in Morrowind, something was stirring in the swamps of Black Marsh. Suddenly, and without warning, the full military might of Argonia came crashing down on the houses of Morrowind. While the Dark Elves barely had warriors to spare, the Argonians managed to emerge from the Oblivion Crisis stronger than ever. As it turns out, the Hist had warned the Argonians of the coming crisis, and when Mayrun's Dagon opened his gates to invade Black Marsh, it was not the Daedra that came pouring out, but the Argonians that went running in to greet him. Finding themselves at full strength by the end of the Oblivion Crisis, the Argonians turned their attention to the people on Tamriel that had been kidnapping their kin for a millennia. Already broken by the loss of their tribunal, the Dunmer of Marwyn had no defense, and they crumbled under the wrath of the Argonian liberators. Thoroughly defeated and exiled from their homeland, 
the Dark Elves fled to places around Tamriel. Of course, Morrowind wasn't really their home to begin with, was it? Before the Dunmer, Morrowind belonged to the Dwemer, the most technologically sophisticated race to ever walk Tamriel. A story for another day. To this day, the Dwemer, or Deep Elves, are the most technologically sophisticated race of mortals to ever grace Tamriel. Their ingenious inventions and deep understanding of the world around them make the other races of men and Myrrh look like primitive apes in comparison. At the height of their evolution, the Dwemer occupied laboratories and strongholds stretching the continent from High Rock to Hammerfell, from Skyrim to their home in Morrowind. Dwemer were one of the most widespread races in Tamriel, yet they were hard to come by. Theirs was an empire that did not need ruby thrones or white gold towers. Instead, they toiled away in the bowels of Nern, researching, crafting, and defining themselves by their works, not their gods. While the other races of men and elves slaughter each other above ground, proclaiming the power of this god and that, the Dwemer abstained from such irrational thinking. They mock the Daedra, the Aedra, and their so-called divines. The Deep Elves believed that if they equipped themselves with reason and logic, then they could acquire the powers that could equal and even rival that of the gods. In their underground cities, the Dwemer studied alchemy and perfected the art of metalworking. Forget what you know about the skills of the Orcish blacksmith or the sturdiness of Nordic steel. Centuries before men and beasts knew proper smithing, Dwemer engineers had already cracked the code. To this day, the modern races of Tamriel still have not uncovered the secret behind their metal. Sure, the Dwemer make a good suit of armor, but their true technological genius lies elsewhere. In the lava of Red Mountain, the Dwemer learned to harvest the power of fire itself. Their mastery of steam power allowed them to create airships, sentient machines, and mechanical observatories. Even today, few adventurers dare brave the ancient Dwemer ruins because they are, quite literally, crawling with Dwemer security. Dwemer spiders, mechanical spheres, and mighty centurions still patrol the corridors of the Dwemer cities. Even though it has been millennia since their master's disappearance, built to last indeed. I like to think that the Dwemer were somewhat comforted by their ability to animate lifeless metal into sentient machines. The mere act of breathing life into an inorganic object defies the gods and their power over life and death. You could think of Dwemer creations as a sort of living testimony to their belief in culture. It was this culture of logic and reason that allowed their technological capabilities to accelerate well ahead of any other race. When comparing the Dwemer to the other races of Tamriel, don't let common misconceptions cloud your judgment. Men call the Dwemer by their western name, Dwarves. This has led to the false belief that a Dwemer has about the same height appearance as a child. Simply by looking at a Dwemer suit of armor, you will see that this is not in fact the case. These quote-unquote Dwarves were no shorter than the other human races. Biologically, the thing that really sets the Deep Elves apart from everyone else is their ability to telepathically communicate with each other. This mental communication benefited the race greatly, seeing as it worked even across vast distances in their underground environments. Like all Tamrielic Elves, the story of the Dwemer starts when the Aldemer allegedly left Aldmeris to settle in the Somerset Isles. Unlike the Dark Elves, we don't really know how the Dwemer ended up splitting off from their fellow Elves. However, we assume this division happened quite early on in their history, considering that Dwemer society bears few correlations with the Altmer. What we do know is that the Dwemer would soon find themselves on the coast of Morrowind, where they founded the city of Dwemerith, a city to call their home. Their newfound isolation would not last forever. The Dwarven people soon found themselves looking at familiar faces when the Chimer Elves came to occupy their already occupied territory. 
The Chimer were a newly formed splinter group of Altamer, who wished to freely worship their Daedric gods. Naturally, the Dwemer scorned and mocked them. Over the coming centuries, the fate of these two cultures would be intertwined. The Dwemer would clash with the Chimer in disputes over land, resources, and of course, religion. While the Chimer and Dwemer squabbled over Morrowind, the Falmer of Skyrim, also known as Snow Elves, were losing a bloody conflict with the human settlers who later would call themselves the Nords. Facing extinction, the remaining Falmer would turn to the Dwemer for help. Some believed that the Dwemer would help their elven cousins by fighting off the Admorans to avenge their fallen and help reclaim their land. This would not be so, and when the Snow Elves came to the Dwemer for help, the Dwemer made a deal with the Snow Elves for their protection. But it was a trap. The Dwemer blinded them by giving them a toxic fungi native to Black Reach. A generation later, the Dwemer had their very own slave race. Back in Morrowind's clashes with the Chimer continued. The cultural differences between the Dwemer and the Chimer proved too great to ignore. Dwarven culture was agnostic and preferred reason over faith. While on the other hand, the Chimer were staunch Daedra worshippers. It seemed all-out war was inevitable, but the Dwemer and the Chimer would soon find themselves in an unlikely alliance. When Nordic warriors invaded Morrowind in the First Era, the Elves had to set aside their differences to face their common enemy, United. The result was the formation of the First Council, a governing group compromised of both Chimer and Dwemer. The First Council succeeded in repelling the Nordic invaders, and the Elves drove the races of men from Morrowind. After 16 years of war, the Chimer and the Dwemer found peace which brought about an unprecedented prosperity for both groups. A golden age, but not for everyone. A clan of rebellious Dwemer refused to join the First Council. They did not trust the Daedra-loving Chimer, and instead chose exile. According to legend, their leader hurls the great hammer Volendrun towards the setting sun, and vowed to settle wherever it landed. The Dwemer named the land Volenfell, which was later translated to Hammerfell. Meanwhile, below the snow-covered landscape of Skyrim, the Falmor were instigating a rebellion of their own. After generations of enslavement, the Snow Elves sought to put their Dwemer masters to the sword. It is the ultimate fate of all slaves and their masters. The War of the Crag was a tireless conflict that was waged in the deep dwarven cities. The Nords living on the surface above carried on with their lives completely oblivious of the blood being spilled beneath them. This war would last decades, until one day, when the Falmer charged the front lines, only to find empty suits of armor. The race of the Dwemer was no more, gone for reasons unknown. At that same time in the neighboring province of Morrowind, the Dwemer and the Chimer were spilling each other's blood in the Battle of Red Mountain. The first council who had brought the elves peace and prosperity for so many centuries was broken. At this time, the high engineer of the Dwemer was a brilliant mind by the name of Kagranak. Kagranak sought to harvest the power of the gods themselves by using the fabled heart of Lorcan. With the heart, Kagranak believed that the Dwemer were ready to ascend to godhood in the form of Numidium. Numidium was the brass god of the Dwemer, a gigantic golem of incredible power. It is thought that Kagranact wished to use the heart of Lorcan to aid his people in ascension, making the Dwemer one with their greatest creation, a union of life energy and steel, the strengths of both, the weaknesses of neither. What happened next? has left Tamriel without answers. In an instant, the Dwemer race, with all its rich culture and brilliance, was gone. An entire people wiped from the tapestry of existence. The time of the Dwemer has passed, and while the Falmer still exist in Skyrim, they too are but a shadow of their former selves. In their place, a race of men will rise, their people strong, their resolve, unwavering. Soon their empire would stretch from east to west, but that 
is a story for another day. Behold, the northern province of Skyrim, cold and rugged. Climb any one of its icy peaks and you'll quickly realize why this old kingdom is considered the throat of the world. Skyrim's pine-covered peaks holds four out of the five highest mountains in all of Tamriel, making it a land kissed by sky. To the uninformed outsider, Skyrim only conjures up images of snow and mud, and while there is truth in this, its citizens know Skyrim as a land of breathtaking vistas, mighty rivers, and above all, a place of proving. It is a land where heroes are made, crafted in the harshness of the land's embrace. To know Skyrim is to know its people. A tall and sturdy race, well suited for the cold climates of the northernmost province, the Nords can tolerate the cold like no one else. If their fair skin and yellow hair does not give them away, then their thick muscles and large frame surely will. The Nordic people have been taming Skyrim's harsh interior for generations, and it shows. They are no strangers to hardship. Whether it be farming the land or defending it against the occasional saber cat, the Nords have been strengthened through their need for survival. And they've done more than just survive. Throughout history, the Nords have proven themselves to be some of the most skilled melee fighters in the realm. Violence is an accepted aspect of Nordic life. Their people face battle with a ferocity that shocks and even appalls their enemies. When he passes from this world, a Nord isn't remembered for how he lived, but for how he died. His tireless quest for honor and glory has made the Nords a force to be reckoned with. Make no mistake, this is a race of conquerors. On the battlefield, Nordic warriors are arguably the hardest fighters Tamriel has ever seen. When the ancient Nords attacked a city, they had no need for siege engines or cavalry. The elite among them speak in the dragon's tongue. Equipped with only their voice, they could force down the doors of an enemy keep. A strong Nord can instill bravery in his men with his battle cry, or stop a charging warrior with his chilling roar. A Nord's voice is his strongest weapon, and he attributes this gift to the Aedra. Atop the throat of the world, in an age long forgotten, the sky goddess Kine breathed life into man. With her divine breath, the Nord found their strength. You may know Kine by her imperial name, Kinnereth. Most Nords acknowledge the Divines as their gods, but unlike the rest of the Empire, the Nords see the Divines as notably more warlike. Just ask the nearest Nord what he thinks about life and death, and you'll have a brief glance into their culture. A Nord will tell you there exists a place so magnificent, so honored, that the entrance lies hidden from view. Sovereign Guard, it is called. Built by the god Shore to honor those Nords who have proven their mettle in war. Nords who die with sword in hand are rewarded with a feast that never ends. Within this Hall of Valor, time as we know it has no meaning. The concepts of life and death are left on the doorstep. And those within exist free of pain and suffering. A Nordic afterlife free of pain and suffering is a pretty ironic thing, isn't it? considering pain and suffering is the price of admittance. The path to Sovereign Guard is littered with the bodies of the fallen. This unique belief system in where only the strong prosper in this life and the next is the very thing that has made the Nords a damned near unstoppable force throughout Tamriel's history. The history of the Nords is one of migration and retribution. Before they took the name Nords, this race of men called themselves Admorans, denizens of the continent known as Admora. Long ago, Admora had erupted in a great civil war that had left the continent drowning in its own blood. In the midst of this chaos, a visionary gathered all who would follow him and set sail to the south in an effort to build a new life for his people. After a perilous journey across the Sea of Ghosts, 
their ship touched ground in modern-day Skyrim, finding the land already occupied by Myr, who they called Snow Elves, the Admorans named the land Myrith, in honor of them. The Admorans and the Snow Elves lived in relative peace for many years, which today would be unheard of for any place where elves and men reside. This was until one fateful night, when the treacherous Snow Elves pillaged and slaughtered the Admorian people. That night, an entire city burned, its people murdered without mourning, without mercy. The Snow Elves, or Falmer as they called themselves, had come to a decision. Apparently the race of men were growing too quickly for their comfort. They did not wish to see men's culture surpass their own. Feeling threatened, the Snow Elves turned to genocide, a sin they would one day pay greatly for. According to legend, not every Admoran was killed that tragic night. Out of the ashes came one visionary and his two sons. They returned to Admora together and spread the news about what the honorless elves had done to them. Five hundred companions heard their stories and joined the Yskimor in an event that would lead to the birth of the Nordic race. The Return Settlement by settlement, city by city, Yskimor and his five hundred companions drove the elven betrayers out of Skyrim. Driving the Snow Elves to near extinction, Yskimor cleared the way for his people to return to Tamriel. The Elves had learned a most painful lesson. The race of men were here to stay. At this time in the Nord's early history, dragons roamed the sky over Skyrim, and the Nords worshipped them. Their frail mortal voices were drowned out by the mighty Thum of the dragon and so it was only natural that these children of Akatosh should rule over them. Dragon priests possessed incredible power, both in their magical abilities and in politics as religious leaders. They acted as intermediaries between the Nords and their serpent god kings, building great underground temples to appease their dragon masters. Over time, the dragon priests of Tamriel had become more tyrannical, and eventually Skyrim rebelled leading to the legendary Dragon War. Man fought the great dragons and died by the thousands. It was clear the Nords were fighting a battle they simply could not win. Yet, when all hope seemed to be lost, some dragons turned against their own kind and taught the Nords powerful magic that allowed them to turn the tide of war in their favor. After a long and bloody campaign, the rule of the dragons was ended, and those remaining fled to remote areas. The Nords, now free from both elves and beasts, claimed Skyrim by right of conquest. And so, the Jarls placed the jagged crown atop the head of their first king of Skyrim, Lord Harald, descendant of the now Nordic legend, Yskimor. Over a century later, the Nords of Skyrim were ready to be led to glory by King Harold's son, the ambitious Vrage the Gifted. King Vrage believed that the destiny of his people was not only to rule over Skyrim, but beyond. His aggressive and bloody expansion is now known as the Skyrim Conquests. Within the span of 50 years, the descendants of Yskimor ruled all of northern Tamriel, including most of present-day High Rock and the whole of Morrowind. Lands had been conquered before in Tamriel's history, but never like this. The elves quickly learned how great the Nords had grown in such a short time, but by then, it was too late. Land the elves had fought over for millennia now belonged to the upstart race of humans, who only centuries earlier posed no real threat at all. Needless to say, the young headstrong Nords struck fear into the hearts of every elf on Tamriel, so reluctantly, the elves had to set aside their differences and face the Nords just as they had, united. Just as the elves were banding together in Morrowind, the last of Yskimor's line was breathing his last in Skyrim, leaving the Nords with a mighty empire, lacking an emperor. Sadly, the Jarls of Skyrim were unable to reach a decision quick enough to decide on which of them were worthy of leadership, and without an emperor, their empire soon fell to the elves. 
now confined to Skyrim, the Nords mostly kept to themselves until late in the First Era, when Tamriel's neighbors in Akavir landed on the icy shores of Skyrim, swords at the ready. With incredible discipline and combat precision, the likes of which the Nords had never seen, the mighty Akaviri Dragon Guard cut through Skyrim with ease. Thoroughly impressed by the Akaviri invaders, the whole of Skyrim pledged themselves to one man, Remen Cyrodiil, the first dragonborn in recorded history. The second empire of man had dawned. Centuries came and went, and the Nords of Skyrim carried on, loyally serving their Akaviri Empire, upholding their kingdom and protecting their people. But even they could not stop the blade of a Morag Tog assassin. With their leaders assassinated, the Second Empire quickly crumbled. Now without an empire, the Nords were free to engage their neighbors in glorious battle once again. However, their expansion would be interrupted when the Daedric Prince Molag Bal sought to make Tamriel burn in the Second Era, the Nords entered one of the most unlikely alliances Tamriel had ever seen. You see, a mortal's need for survival has a way of transcending race, and so it was the Nords banded together with the Argonians of Black Marsh and the Dark Elves of Morrowind. In an effort of self-preservation, the Nords formed the boisterous front line of the Ebonheart Pact lending their skill as fierce warriors and expert weaponsmiths. Once the fires of Tamriel were put out, the Nords fell back into their old traditions and began their aggressive expansion once again. What they weren't counting on was Tiber Septim and his newly formed Imperial Legions who sought to usher in the Third Era with an empire of their own. After a few honorable confrontations with Tiber Septim's Imperials, the Nords knew an empire when they saw one. While most of Tamriel was dragged into the Empire, the Nords chose to join their fellow man willingly. After all, the human Imperials shared many of their qualities, having been cut from the same cloth. Many Nords soon donned the Imperial uniform, gladly serving under their new Emperor. Tiber Septim may have taken an Imperial name, but the Nords knew him by Talos, son of Admora. Talos was Dragonborn, the likes of which the Nords had seen before. Dragons and those claiming the power of dragons seemed to be destined to rule. Dominance is in a dove's very nature, and while men hopelessly cling to their perpetually crumbling empires, Tamriel's extinct race was ready to take back their birthright. But that is a story for another day. Before the birth of men, the dragons ruled all of Mundus. Their word was the voice, and they spoke only for true needs, for the voice could blot out the sky and flood the land. Men were born and spread over the face of Mundus. The dragons presided over the crawling masses. Men were weak then and had no voice. The fledgling spirits of men were strong in old times, unafraid to war with dragons and their voices. But the dragons only shouted them down and broke their hearts. Kine called on Parthenax, who pitied man. Together they taught men to use the voice. Then dragon war raged. Dragon against tongue. Power is truth. The mortals call them dragons, but in their tongue they are dove, children of fire. They have resided here on Tamriel far longer than the frail groundlings, and their immortal souls will persist long after. While the childish races squabble over their piles of rocks and dirt, the Dove hold dominion over the boundless sky. Although animalistic in appearance, they are known for their intelligence and wisdom as much as their raw, uncontrollable power. A Dove's drive for ambition and dominance is unparalleled. Dragon. The very word conjures up images of shadowed skies, hideous roaring and endless fire. Indeed, the dragons are a beautiful and terrifying race. At first encounter an unlucky adventurer hears the dragon's bone-chilling roar that can be heard 
for miles around. The Dove aren't subtle creatures. Who needs to be subtle when you've got bones stronger than steel, talons the length of scimitars, and massive jaws capable of snapping a carriage in two? With all this brawn, one would think that such a creature wouldn't need much else. On the contrary, a Dova's greatest weapon is his thum, his voice. The Dove possess their own spoken and written language. The mortals call it the Dragon's Tongue, and it is an ancient power that goes beyond simple comprehension. Understanding a single Rot Mulag, or word of power, requires years of study. For a dragon, this comprehension is woven into their very being. Words of power can be shouted to produce magical effects. The Nords call them shouts, or thums. When a dragon breathes fire, ice, or wind, he is speaking in his native tongue. It is important to note that dragons make absolutely no distinction between speaking and fighting. Battles between Dove are in actuality deadly verbal debates. In the mind of a dragon, being powerful and being right are one and the same. The Dove with the loudest voice leads the race as a whole. The Dove are the immortal children of Akatosh, the dragon god of time. Thanks to this connection with their father, dragons are especially attuned to the flow of time. They do not see the world as we do. Mortals are here on Nern for but a moment, but as children of Akatosh, the dragons have a deeper connection with the bones of Nern, and as such, they are believed to be bound here for eternity. This concept of immortals living a mortal life can be confusing. Scholars have had the opportunity to question several Jamora who claim dragons simply were and are eternal, immortal, unchanging and unyielding. Their souls in fact endure beyond physical death. They do not mate or breed as animals do. As such, there are no known examples of dragon eggs or dragonlings. As a matter of fact, dragons have no real gender, at least not in the mortal sense. Being directly connected to the Aedra, Dove are considered to be lesser Aedra. Granted, I would not use the word lesser to describe a dragon, at least not to his face. Are dragons immortal? Yes. But the real question is, can they be killed? There is but one who can truly defeat a Dova. In their tongue, he is Dovahkiin, Dragonborn. A true Dragonborn strikes fear into the hearts of Dove. This rare individual may have a mortal's body, but he has been born with the blood and soul of a dragon. This rare gift makes a Dovahkiin brother to all dragons. Able to use dragon shouts, the Dragonborn is the most dangerous threat a Dova can face. He can consume a slain dragon's soul and absorb its knowledge. Once a dragon's soul has been consumed, the creature is gone from this world, permanently. Know this, true Dragonborn scarcely exist, and it is rare for more than one to appear within an era. Each time a true Dova King has appeared in history, it is often to rule over men. The self-proclaimed firstborn of Akatosh is believed to be the first dragon to come into existence. His name, Alduin. The precise origin of Alduin and his kin is unknown to us, but we can draw that the Dove are indigenous to the continent of Akavir, whose culture and society has been heavily influenced by these powerful beings. From Akavir, the Dove spread their wings to Tanriel. Much later, when the humans of Edmora arrived in Skyrim, they bowed down and worshipped the mighty dragons. Naturally, the Dove embraced this worship without question. In their eyes, they were clearly superior to the tiny, frail, and short-lived groundlings that worshipped them. To a Dova, power equals truth, and their power over men was absolute. In exchange for their obedience, the Dove granted small amounts of power to their chosen priests. In time, the chosen dragon priest would rule over men, wielding authority equal to that of kings. The dragon priests of Skyrim ruled with an iron fist, making slaves out of the rest of the population. And as is the fate of all slaves and their masters, the population soon rebelled against them. 
The Dragon War was one of the bloodiest and most single-sided conflicts ever waged on Tamrielic soil. The men in ancient times were brave, but bravery alone does not slay dragons. For a time they fought the Dove and died by the thousands. The race of men were being wiped off the face of Tamriel, and just as all hope for survival seemed to be lost, the Aedra turned their divine gaze on man and took pity on him. The Nordic goddess Kine sought out Alduin's right hand, a Dova by the name of Parthenax. Kine recruited Alduin's lieutenant to deliver man from his demise. Parthenax taught the power of the voice to mankind. And so it was man prevailed, shouting Alduin out of this world, proving for all that their voice too was strong. With their leader Alduin banished by a group of Nord heroes, the few dragons that survived the war fled to remote places away from men. The once dominant race of immortals were no more. Yet strangely enough, the dragon cult itself survived. The remaining cultists built great dragon mounds, within them the dormant bones of the dragons. The cultists believed that one day the dragons would rise again and reward the faithful. For the rest of Tamriel though, that day would seem to never come. With the dragons gone, men were free to forge their own destinies, and soon founded empires of their own. One such empire would dare to do the impossible, and bring all of Tamriel under their banner. Their sigil of dominance? Well that's a story for another day. They call it the Bleeding Heart of Tamriel. So many have spilled their blood for the Ruby Throne, it's a wonder why the Nibbin River doesn't run red. As Tamriel's centralmost province, Cyrodiil has become the ultimate seat of power in Tamriel. With the White Gold Tower acting as the Citadel of Civilization, Cyrodiil is arguably the most influential of the Nine Provinces. It cannot be disputed. The events that take place in Cyrodiil are liable to echo in every corner of the continent. Like the Red Diamond at the center of the Amulet of Kings, Cyrodiil lies at the center of Tamriel. This crown jewel of the provinces is dominated by lush green forests and crystal blue rivers. At times rivaling the natural beauty of Valenwood, this land has been written about since mortals had hands for writing. The fertile river valley of the Nibbane Basin has made certain citizens of the heartlands the wealthiest people in the empire. The finest wines and ripest fruits are plucked from the fields of Cyrodiil, making it the breadbasket of Tamriel. Aside from its fertile reputation, Cyrodiil does have varying climates. Since Cyrodiil borders nearly every other province, there is a climate suitable for everyone. Near the borders of Black Marsh, are the swamplands of Blackwood, a place an Argonian can call home. In the north, bordering Skyrim, cold snow-covered mountains offers a place for the resilient Nords. Aside from Cyrodiil's diversity, primarily human emperors have wielded their power from the strategic center of the continent, and because of this, many simply call Cyrodiil the Imperial Province. The Imperials They've conquered many civilizations on the battlefield, but they are most known for their skills in diplomatic relations. Theirs is a race of silver tongues, and it has brought them more glory than any sword ever could. Whether it be getting a pompous elf to offer peace terms, or bartering a Khajiit out of his last bowl of moon sugar, the Imperials have an act for talking their way out of just about anything. This mastery of speechcraft is a most valuable gift to have, and it is no small reason why the Imperials have successfully managed cooperation between the other mortal races. Any alliance where men and elves must call each other comrade requires a certain charisma, a charisma that the Imperials seem to wield with ease. For an Imperial, the tongue and quill are the deadliest weapons. But on the battlefield, this race of men are more than capable fighters. Imperials are known for their discipline and training of their citizen armies. Their forces boast a discipline and strategic mindset rarely seen outside their great empire. 
their boasts are well founded. Cyrodiil has produced some of the greatest military tacticians Tamriel has ever produced. The Imperials are physically less imposing than the other races. They are not as strong as their Nord cousins, nor as magically adept as the Bretons. Even so, Imperials are renowned for their remarkable skill and training as light infantry. This flexibility has helped the Imperials stay nimble on the battlefield, thus able to switch tactics more easily. A Nord might question the strength of an Imperial sword arm, but then again, that Nord is likely found serving in the Imperial Legion. The Imperial Legion proclaims itself to be the most disciplined and effective military force in history. Its mission? To preserve the peace and rule of law in the Empire. In peacetime, the Legion serves primarily as a garrison force, manning forts, patrolling roads, and providing guardsmen for towns and cities. During conflicts, the Legion serves as an invading and occupying force, overwhelming opposition with pure numbers and strategic planning. You can say that one of the major factors of the Legion's widespread success and fame springs from their military tactics. The Legion isn't known for rushing into battles they cannot win. Every aspect of warfare is accounted for in Legionary operations, and the Legion is careful to analyze every avenue of action. People would say another factor of their success can be attributed to their unmatched versatility. The Empire is made up of elves, men, and beasts. The Legion recruits individuals of all races and creeds into its ranks and benefits immeasurably from the diversity and skills they all bring to the table. This diversity is woven into the very fabric of Imperial society. The Imperial way of life is defined by cosmopolitanism. Every race on Tamriel, no matter how alien their culture, belongs to a single community. Both men and Myr have a mortal sense between good and evil, and through that shared morality, the Imperials cradle civilization itself. Now, as a race, the Imperials aren't immune to bigotry and intolerance, but in general, the average Imperial does know how to put their best foot forward when dealing with the other races. This spirit of cooperation certainly lends to the fact that the Imperials have excelled at trade. Their society is built on the efficiency of the Empire's extensive trade network. Whether it be moving food by carriage or textiles by boat, Cyrodiil, and more specifically the Imperial City, is the center of trade and commerce. The Imperial need for trade has given birth to monopolies like the East Empire Trading Company, a mercantile group chartered by the Emperor himself. Thanks to their economic influence, the Imperials surely have left their mark. The Gold Septum is the main currency in Tamriel, named after the Imperial Dynasty of Tiber Septim, though you might know him as Talos. The story of the Imperial race is one of oppression, rebellion, and eventually, domination. Before the rise of men on Tamriel, the Imperial race is said to have emerged out of the original tribesmen who resided in Cyrodiil, as well as the original Nords who arrived in Tamriel from the continent of Admora. In a time before the First Era, this young, then primitive race were enslaved by the more civilized and refined elves. This particular group of Aldmer called themselves the Aeliads. Before the word Imperial touched mortal lips, the Aeliads had established the first empire Tamriel had ever seen. In ancient Cyrodiil, the Imperials toiled in service to their elven masters, but that would soon change because of one woman and her prayer. Alicia was born in one of Cyrodiil's many human tribes, and grew up like all humans of Cyrodiil did in the First Era, as a slave under the Aeliads. The Aeliad civilization worshipped the moralist Daedra, bargaining with them to help keep the younger race of man subservient. Alicia prayed desperately for her people's deliverance, and the bones of Nern itself would answer her. Akatosh, the dragon god of time, heard Alicia's prayers for help and gave her his blessing, a blessing that would one day lead to the birth of the imperial race. Saint Alicia was blessed with dragon's blood, and with it an Adric artifact called the Amulet of Kings. Handing the amulet down to Alicia, Akatosh made a promise to all of mankind that so long as the Empire shall maintain its worship of Akatosh and his kin, 
and so long as Alicia's heirs should bear the amulet of kings, Akatosh and his divine kin shall maintain a strong barrier between Tamriel and Oblivion, so that mortal man need never again fear the devastating summoned hosts of the Daedra Lords. With this covenant, Alicia spearheaded a great rebellion against the Daedra-loving Aeliads. After forging alliance with the Nords of Skyrim, who themselves conquered the Snow Elves, man fought side by side to free Cyrodiil from its elven yoke. After a long campaign against their masters, Elysian and Nordic forces surrounded the beacon of Aeliad civilization, the Weichel Tower. It soon fell, and the Aeliads, once proud and mighty, were driven from Cyrodiil. Know this, that day marked the second greatest moment in man's history on Tamriel. The history of the Nords is the history of man's arrival on Tamriel, and Cyrodiil is the throne from which they will decide their destiny. The Elysian Empire is considered to be the first empire of the Imperials, not to be mistaken with the first empire of the Nords. One of the first challenges facing this new empire was the establishment of a religion acceptable both for the people of Cyrodiil and for their Nordic allies, who were opposed to any elven deities. Saint Alacia established the Eight Divines, which incorporated elements of both Old Mary and Nordic religion. Alicia's compromise was so successful that this religion continues to be the dominant religion on Tamriel even to this day. With this newfound religion that sought to unite cultures, Saint Alicia's successors would expand their empire all the way into High Rock, thus eclipsing the empire their alien masters once ruled. Although their empire reached far and wide, the Elysian Empire would one day crumble from within, resulting in a great civil war that left Cyrodiil divided for centuries to follow. As is the popular trend of history, Cyrodiil would not be united again until tragedy threatened its people. It is the closing years of the First Era, and the Elysian Empire is now but a distant memory. Tamriel is divided, and Cyrodiil even more so. Someone somewhere must have smelled opportunity because something was amiss in the neighboring province of Morrowind. On Tamriel's eastern coast, raiders were making landfall from Akavir, and they seemed to have their eyes set on one goal. With the utmost haste, Akaviri forces pushed towards Cyrodiil through the Jarrow Mountains. The invaders swept through Tamriel with ease until one man stood in their way. The Son of the West, Raymond Cyrodiil. By capitalizing on a mutual need for survival, Raymond Cyrodiil managed to muster an army to oppose the Akaviri invaders. In order to accomplish this, Raymond had to unite the peoples of Cyrodiil for the first time since the Elysian Empire. With this newfound army at his disposal, Raymond not only stopped the foreign invaders, but he convinced them to help him build his own empire, which went on to conquer most of Tamriel. The Second Empire of Man had dawned, ushering in the Second Era with it. Empires are destined to rise and fall. The Imperials knew this better than anyone. When the Second Imperial Empire fell centuries later, the nine provinces of Tamriel sadly fell along with it into disarray. This time period is called the Interregnum, and it was the darkest moment in Tamriel's history. Living standards were in decline, roads and cities fell into ruin, and even the famed Amulet of Kings was lost thus suspending the covenant Akatosh had made with mankind and enabling the Daedric Prince Molag Bal to invade Tamriel. The Imperial Province devolved into a collection of warlords squabbling over a no man's land. Centuries later, and ironically enough, it would take a Nord to reunite the Imperial Province. And he did more than just unite it. He brought the Imperials a civilization, the likes of which Tamriel had never seen. Tiber Septim took the chaos and disorder of the provinces and united them under the imperial banner. Nine provinces, each with their own unique races and history, are drawn together into one identity. Tamriel stands as one collective people, and the nine provinces knew a peace and prosperity that was unprecedented. The Imperials now stand at the apex of civilization. Their third empire achieved more than any civilization before it and its influence on Nern will echo for millennia. 
Like all empires before it, this one too would inevitably fall. But in the meantime, imperial culture will creep its way into every corner of society. The Imperials have left their mark, and Nern will not soon forget them. But let us not forget, the ideas of empires was not a construct of man. Before men knew the word civility, the Aeliads erected an empire of their own. With a society so rich and sophisticated, the Imperials to this day emulate it. But that is a story for another day. They were the first. The first to sit upon the ruby throne, the first to call the White Gold Tower home. They were the first to raise a mighty empire, but after rebellion, would soon retire. Much like their lost Wemmer cousins, the Aeliads were a magnificently sophisticated race who cradled civilization, only to have it ripped away from them, leaving Tamriel to pick up the pieces. Many have forgotten it was the Aeliads who laid the groundwork for the great empires raised throughout Tamriel's history. Though not as technologically advanced as the Dwemer, culturally the Aeliads were well ahead of their time. The Aeliads, with their many diverse kingdoms, were the first to dream of unity. While the young, savage races of men were still huddled around their campfires, Aeliad ingenuity had erected vast cities, towering monuments, and their society was the envy of the Nine Provinces. In ancient times, Aeliads dominated Tamriel's centralmost province of Cyrodiil, and so they were given the name Heartland High Elves. High Elves because, like all elves on Tamriel, the Aeliads came out of the High Elves of the Somerset Isles. Thanks to their high-born ancestry, the Aeliads boast big intellects and agile frames like the rest of their race. As for their appearance, like all elves, they are thin and lean, with pointed ears and angular faces. From fire life, from light magic, to say the Aeliads were gifted in the arcane arts is a bit of an understatement. This conclusion can be drawn from their many ancient cities that still dot Cyrodiil's landscape today. Their ruins contain a vast variety of stones filled with magicka essences. Upon further studies, scholars have been able to gather that the Aeliads found a way to harvest magical energy from the stars themselves a process that has not been replicated since. Using these magical stones, Aeliad mages could replenish their magical energy, making them last longer in confrontations. On the note of harvesting magical energy, a visitor to Cyrodiil will often stumble across great white basins called Aeliad Wells. These wells are unlike anything found in the Nine Provinces and possibly beyond. They are known to passively harvest magical energy from starlight. Those with a skill can draw magicka from Aeliad Wells to restore their own reservoirs of magical energy. A mage that has exhausted his or her energy needs only seek out these wells. You can see how beneficial this could be both in everyday activity as well as in the defense of Aeliad settlements. Another magical feat of strength attributed to the Aeliads was the creation and maintaining of Varla Stones. Varla stones are remarkably powerful devices that enabled the Aeliads to restore magical energy to enchanted items. An enchanted sword, for instance, can wield enchantments of fire, ice, and lightning, and Varla stones keep these enchants at maximum power by continuously feeding them with magicka required to maintain the enchant. Because of these stones' great value and utility, it is assumed Aeliad soldiers would carry these stones onto the battlefield. Since Varla stones are relatively small, you could see how an Aeliad infantryman could carry them on their person. A sword that slashes and pierces is good, a sword that melts armor is better. As you've probably gathered by now as a race, the Aeliads were not afraid to tap into the more supernatural mysteries of Tamriel in order to gain an edge. Magic was a revered part of their society, and it bled through into their religion. In accordance with High Elf tradition, the Aeliads believed the Earth was composed of four basic elements. Earth, water, air, and light. The Aeliads in particular believed that the most spiritual form an element could take was starlight, as the stars were the link between Mundus and Aetherius. Mundus being our mortal plane of existence, and Aetherius being the immortal plane of the Aedra. When Magnus left Mundus to pass into the Aedric realm of Aetherius, 
He is said to have torn a veil between the two realms, giving us the sun and stars, enabling mortals to draw magic from the heavens. The Aliens recognize the Aedra's role in giving them their magical abilities, so as a people, these Heartland High Elves worship the Aedra. On this note, you might find it interesting that Tamriel has all but forgotten the original purpose of the iconic White Gold Tower. The tower wasn't originally built for kings and emperors, the tower was built by the Aliens as a monument to the Aedra. In ancient times, the White Gold Tower was called the Temple of the Ancestors, referring to the ancestors of the Elves, the immortal Aedra. For most of the other races on Tamriel, worship stops at the Aedra, or the Daedra, but for the Aelids, power meant these lines had to be crossed. Instead of limiting themselves by worshipping one side over the other, the Aelids chose to praise the Aedra while conspiring with the Daedra. So great became the influence of Daedra on Aelid culture that the Heartland Elves commanded massive armies of Daedric minions. Wielding both the power of the Daedra through powerful armies and the power of the Aedra through magical prowess, the Aelids brought an entire province under their control by enslaving the race of men residing in it, a sin they would one day pay greatly for. The Foaming Wave so thunderous, so mighty, heralds the lordly elves. The story of the Aelids is one of migration, domination, and ultimately self-destruction. Like all Tamrielic elves, the story of the Aelids starts on the mysterious continent of Aldmeris. From Aldmeris, the ancient Altmer migrated to the Somerset Isles. Why the Aelids eventually broke off from their elven brethren is unknown to us, but we can assume this division occurred for the same reason that the Dark Elves found themselves in Morrowind, because worship of the Daedra is not tolerated in Somerset. Regardless of how they came to be there, the Aelids would find themselves in Cyrodiil in a time before the First Era. How the Aelids came to rule all of Cyrodiil can be attributed to their incessant need for power. It was this ambition that drove these elves to do truly magnificent and sometimes truly terrible things. The aliens of this ancient era saw breakthroughs and rose structures that baffle scholars in the modern era. Given all their skills and feats, the aliens still craved more. They went on to employ entire armies of Daedra to conquer, subjugate, and enforce their rule in Cyrodiil. At first, the men of Cyrodiil had managed to resist the aliens, but they could not withstand their Daedric allies. Through their pact with the Daedra, the Aelids dominated and enslaved the men of Cyrodiil. They rose their great temple, and ever since, the White Gold Tower has stood as a symbol of dominance in Cyrodiil. He who holds the tower holds the reins of the province. The first empire Temriel had ever seen was claimed in the name of the Aelids. Slaves were utilized by the Aelid Empire for a variety of purposes, but their main purpose was the building and maintenance of their empire's infrastructure. The men of Cyrodiil had the Elves to answer to, and the Elves had to answer to the Daedra. Daedric masters demand many things in exchange for power, chief among them sacrifices. According to legend, some Aelids turned cruelty into an art form. Various Aelid settlements became famous for their elaborate methods of torturing their slaves. One such method involved the setting ablaze of human children. The Heartland High Elves ruled Cyrodiil for many generations, and although their power was absolute, they did not know contentment. For reasons now lost to us, the Aelids took to fighting amongst themselves in a civil war that would one day spell their race's downfall. You see, civil war left the Aelids weak, and word had reached the slaves in Cyrodiil about the events taking place in Skyrim. At this time, Skyrim had emerged from a war of its own. The race of men who called themselves Nords had overthrown the Snow Elves who once ruled the province of Skyrim. The stories from the North inspired the slaves now serving under an elven empire at war with itself. The Nords of Skyrim, now free from their elven yoke, lent aid to their enslaved relatives under the Aelid Empire, and in only a year, the slave queen Alicia stood outside of the White Gold Tower with an army at her back. After millennia of rule, the Aelid Empire fell, giving way to the Elysian Empire, securing the shift of power from elves to men on Tamriel henceforth. 
The story of how the Daedra-loving Aeliads fell to their human slaves is one that has been retold time and again. It has served as a kind of rallying cry for the Nords Imperials and other races of men on Tamriel. A story of how the oppressed can overthrow his oppressor, even if that oppressor is a highborn elf. The story that isn't often told is the one of how some Aeliads actually assisted man in their quest for freedom. Not every Aeliad was the pompous, power-hungry elf the stories would have you believe. As a matter of fact, there were whole Aeliad settlements that had no part in the Aeliad Empire. When the human slaves of the Aeliad Empire rebelled, many Aeliad lords pledged their swords in support of the slave queen, and they died on the battlefield fighting side by side with man. By the end of the slave rebellion, the Aeliads were far from the extinct race they are today. As a matter of fact, the Aeliad lords that assisted in the rebellion were integrated into the newly formed Elysian Empire as vassals and royal advisors to the queen and her new human nobility. This arrangement only made sense, I mean who if not the Aeliads knew the logistics of maintaining an empire. History has failed us because it has mostly forgotten the first human empire was one comprised of both man and elves. Despite these truths, bad feelings and resentment would ultimately decide the fate of the Aeliad race. Alicia's eventual passing marked the rising of a religious group called the Elysian Order, and they had very, very strong opinions about their old Aeliad masters. Its doctrine called for the expulsion of the entire elven race. The Aeliad lordships were abolished, and feeling no welcome to stay in Cyrodiil, the Aeliads left the province upon their own free will. Now driven from the land they had resided in for generations, the Aeliads were a people without a home. Once the very beacon of civilization on Tamriel, the other mortal races now call the Aeliads Wild Elves, because they are without sanctuary. Although their race has not been seen for centuries, it is possible that the Aeliads are still out there. Although we have no pure Aeliads left in civil society, their bloodlines carry on. After the Wild Elves left Cyrodiil, some of them found solace in the province of High Rock. There they are only assumed to have intermingled with the humans who call High Rock home. The Bretons are, after all, part elf, and particularly gifted in the ways of magic. But that is a story for another day. If the ancient stories are to be believed, then in a time before mortals, the gods ruled over Tamriel from their seat in High Rock. The Adamantine Tower stands as the single oldest structure in Tamriel, and it is said to be the place where the gods decided the fate of a newly formed planet called Nern. Perhaps this is merely myth, but when the ancient elves first stepped foot in High Rock, the tower was already standing, leading us to believe that the history of Tamriel, and possibly Nern itself, begins at High Rock. High Rock, the westernmost province on the mainland of Tamriel, is a land of temperate climates and soft rolling hills split in half by the towering mountains of the Reach. The quaint charm of its hamlets speak of a gentle life. With its fertile soils and generally climate weather, it is little wonder that the region, now known as High Rock, has attracted many cultures throughout its history, chief among them, the Bretons. The Bretons are a mixed breed, the descendants of both elven and human lineage. In appearance, they are more man than myrrh, even so, they are sometimes crudely referred to as the mongrel race of Tamriel. Call them what you will, but the Bretons benefit immeasurably as a hybrid race. Elven blood moves through their veins. The Bretons have a special talent for all things arcane. This genetic advantage makes the Bretons the strongest spellcasters among the other races of men. This, combined with their human descent, makes this race of mortals the most skilled battle mages in the realm. Intellectually, the Bretons are better compared to the Altmer, but physically, the Bretons most closely resemble their Nordic cousins in Skyrim. At first glance, this race is undoubtedly human. However, upon closer examination, you can see traces of their highborn ancestry. The Bretons are more frail than most all their human cousins, and they share their sharp appearance with the elves, including higher cheekbones, lean eyebrows, and some even have slight points in their ears. Passionate, eccentric, poetic, flamboyant, intelligent, witful, excellent cooks, 
All these things describe the Bretons. They are a people that share a very rich and very tasteful culture. Regrettably though, that is all they share. You see, politically, the Bretons are one of the most divided people on Tamriel. The power struggle amongst the various monarchs and powers of High Rock is a deeply integrated and even sometimes cherished part of Breton culture. Within the single province of High Rock, there is a plethora of kingdoms and nobility. Indeed, it is an old joke amongst the Bretons. Find a new hill, become a king, and many have taken it to heart. Youths of all professions and trade in High Rock spend their free time in knightly pursuits, performing good deeds and the like, in hopes to one day achieve a noble status. This quest obsession, more than anything, has served as High Rock's sense of national identity and binds its people together. On a more somber note, the social structure of the Bretons has divided itself into a poor middle class and destitute peasantry. Above them stands the magical elite and even higher rules the noble families. Some visitors to High Rock might look at the Breton culture and dismiss it as an unfair place to be brought up. On the contrary though, many Bretons embrace this challenge by climbing the ladder to nobility. This culture in where people are raised in the pursuit of their dreams has driven the Breton race to incredible heights. We stumbled across their camp just as the morning sun rose to greet the new day. A few of them were already awake and roving the encampment carrying on their meager tasks, completely unaware that my Nordic brethren and I were watching them from the brush. They were elves, that much was clear. However, there was something different about them. I brought this up to my shield brother. An elf is an elf, he said. They deserve nothing but a swift death. I granted an agreement, and with that we rushed the encampment, our battle cries striking fear into the hearts of our enemies. We easily crushed the elven scum, which made what happened next that much harder to swallow. In the heat of battle, I came across one of their elders. Before I could give him a clean death, he began to wail for his life. Normally. This would only encourage me to put an end to the milk drinker cowardly enough to beg for mercy. But then, something unexpected happened. He spoke. In my language. I understood him. These were no elves we were killing. These were our people. At least, they used to be. What the Nordic war party had discovered that day was a mongrel race between elf and human the earliest form of Bretons. Upon further investigation, the Nords were able to gather that these mixed breeds were the remnants of one of their long-lost human tribes. You see, the elves had settled in High Rock centuries before man ever did. Centuries later, when the first human settlers eventually did migrate to High Rock, they were stumbling across a already highly sophisticated culture of elves, and, as is the popular trend of history, their less sophisticated human culture was quickly absorbed into a more advanced elven culture. A race would eventually emerge out of this assimilation, the race our Nordic war party had discovered, the Bretons. It took many centuries for the Bretons to become the dominant force in High Rock. The first generation of Bretons were considered second-class citizens to the purebred elves. Although they were of elven descent and thus had elder blood coursing through their veins, the infant race of Bretons weren't treated as equals. For most of the first era, the elves kept their hold on the land. Whether it be the later Breton families or early elven families, the fate of High Rock was primarily decided by the noble families throughout the ages. Of all the families that had ruled from High Rock, none did it so successfully as the clan of elves known as Clan Dereni. A powerful family in their own right, Clan Dereni was a hegemony of elven merchants who became the undisputed rulers in High Rock. With so many squabbling kingdoms, it's hard to believe anyone could tame the political puzzle that is High Rock. So to make sense of this, we need look no further than the Aliens. As it just so happens, it was the Aliens' exile from Cyrodiil that is said to have strengthened Clan Dereni. As empire builders themselves, the Aeliads proved indispensable to Clan Dereni, and before long, High Rock, and by extension, the Bretons, fell completely under their control. 
So dominant were they that by the middle of the first era, the whole of High Rock was commonly called the Dureni Hegemony. At the peak of their power, the Dureni Hegemony controlled nearly a quarter of Tamriel, including portions of Skyrim and Hammerfell. The Dureni Hegemony was nothing short of an empire, so naturally it would one day fall. And who do you think was ready to take control of High Rock after the Elves? The Bretons. They were operating beneath the eyes of history, and their rise in High Rock was a slow and gradual one that took many generations under the Elves. After the Elven hegemony fell, High Rock would be claimed by the Bretons, not by any act of war, but by simply being assimilated by them. Under the Elves, the Bretons had learned the art of politics, culture, and war, but the greatest lesson the Bretons took from their Elven masters was the means to assimilate and absorb other cultures. By the end of the first era, High Rock was the land of the Bretons, and it would be forevermore. High Rock now belongs to the Bretons, but that doesn't mean they stood united as a race. As we said before, the Bretons learned many things from their elven ancestors, such as the idea of nobility and royal families. The power vacuum left by the decline of the elves fractured the Bretons into a hundred different kingdoms, fighting for a hundred different kings. The Bretons would carry on like this into the Second Era, and according to history, there was only one thing that would stop the bickering Breton nobility long enough to set aside their dreams of ambition, the Daedric Prince, Molog Bal. When an army of undead poured out of the realm of Cold Harbor to threaten Tamriel in the Second Era, the kingdoms of High Rock banded together to ensure survival. With the power struggle put on hold for the impending apocalypse, the Bretons pledged their loyalty to a merchant lord, High King Emmerich. The united Breton kingdoms were strong, but the Daedric threat was far too great for any one race to face alone, so the Bretons did what the Bretons do best. They used politics and diplomacy to get what they wanted. What they needed was allies, so they found them by enlisting the help of the Orcs and the Red Guards. Together, their alliance made up what came to be called the Daggerfall Covenant. The Bretons' natural gifts in magic and diplomacy served the Covenant well, and as home to the capital, High Rock wielded a considerable amount of power during this time of war. Once the threat had subsided, however, the Covenant was thrown aside and the Bretons fell back into their old traditions. High King Emmerich would go down in history as the first and only High King of the Bretons. It is now the dawning of the Third Era, marking the arrival of Tiber Septim. When the Imperials and their legions marched through the province of High Rock, they met the harsh welcome of High Rock's battle mages. For a time, some Breton kingdoms resisted the Third Empire, but knowing that their divided kingdoms wouldn't stand for long, many Bretons soon elected to join the Empire. Instead of simply being assimilated by imperial rule, the Bretons turned the tables and used their gifts and diplomacy to influence the empire they served under. Funny enough, most emperors of the Third Empire were Bretons themselves or had spent their youth in High Rock. Even under the Third Empire, internal conflicts continue to dominate High Rock. It seems even the imperial empire can't keep the Breton nobility from grabbing at each other's throats. In the later years of the Third Era, High Rock stood as divided as it ever was, but something was about to rock the very foundation of Nern that would redefine the province in the most mysterious of ways. They call this event the Miracle of Peace. On the 10th of Frostfall, a strange force exploded over High Rock, displacing armies and decimating whole territories. Though its nature is still unknown, most Bretons believe it was the ancient gods who had once made High Rock their home in the Adamantine Tower. They saw the bickering Breton kingdoms, and they wished to make High Rock whole once again. Though it was a painful process for most, the miracle is sometimes spoken as the warp in the west. The result was a province that was more unified than it had ever been in modern history. Where once there were a hundred bickering Breton kingdoms in High Rock, today there are three. Daggerfall, Weirist, and Orsinium. Orsinium being home to a barbaric beast race that the Bretons didn't often get along with. As a matter of fact, you could say they despised each other, but as fate would have it, they would be forced to share a home in High Rock. The Orcs and the Bretons have more in common than either of them would probably like to admit. 
the lineage of both of their races could be traced back to the elves, but that is a story for another day. Every man, woman, and child inside the walls is trained from birth to defend it. The orc strongholds have existed for as long as the orc race has, and each one represents its denizens perfectly. The orcs are a widespread race of outcasts who cling to their independence like a Nord clings to his mead. Most citizens of Tamriel regard orc society as rough and cruel, but there is much to admire in their fierce tribal loyalties and generous equality of rank and respect. You won't find an orc trying to cheat you in a trade, and you won't find them picking a fight with someone who can't handle it. In general, the orcs are, above all, honor-bound. The other mortal races might see them as cruel savages, but they never sought the enslavement of any people or forced any religion on those who would have none. If history is to have a voice, let it be known that the orcs have sought nothing more but a good fight. To stand face to face with an orc on the battlefield is to know fear. The battle-hardened Nords of Skyrim might look formidable, but no one wields intimidation like an orc. Their muscular frames and unshakable courage make them hardened enough, but to go anywhere near an orc berserker who has gone into a rage is just plain suicide. Above all, an orc relies on strength and raw stamina. Battle axes, claymores, warhammers, they are all wielded with ease by even the meekest orc. When meeting an orc warband on an open field, first attempt to run. If you can't do that, at least make peace with your maker. On the battlefield, an orc warrior has been readily compared to a frenzied ox. Anything that comes too close leaves looking like it's been chopped under a butcher's cleaver. Even if you were to land a blow on an orc, you've probably only managed to piss him off. Orcish steel is made out of one of the densest metals mined on Nern, and Orcish blacksmiths are renowned for their metalwork, but not renowned like the elves are renowned. Elven armor has to look pretty and decorated, while Orcish armor is crude and frankly downright ugly. Like the race they are modeled after, Orcish armor might be lackluster on the outside, but it is built to take an incredible amount of punishment. The Nords brag and flaunt their steel, hell, they even sing songs about them. But on the battlefield, the orcs cut through their armor like butter. When it comes to craftsmanship that simply gets the job done, no one bests an orc. The translation of Awesomer is pariah folk. You see, the orcs are considered to be the social outcasts of Tamriel. Due to this, many Tamrielic cultures have scorned the orcs and treated them as no more than callous brutes. Their only redeeming quality in the eyes of the public over the last few eras has been their combat skills when serving in the Imperial Legion. That's right, not all orcs stay in their strongholds. As a matter of fact, like the other races, many orcs leave their homes at a young age in search of adventure. Those orcs who leave their strongholds are liable to become sellswords or soldiers under the legion. Once an orc leaves his stronghold, he is forever labeled a city orc by his brothers. With the exception of those individuals fighting under the Imperial Empire, the orcs follow no laws save their own, an unwritten set of rules called the Code of Malakath. Most of it's pretty simple. Don't steal, don't kill, don't attack people for no reason, although there seems to be a long list of exceptions to this rule. Orcs don't have jails for their criminals. Such a practice is counterproductive in a society where everyone must pull their own weight. The orcs will tell you that putting a man behind bars only to clothe and feed him seems stupid. To break the code in a stronghold means you either pay enough in goods for your crimes or you bleed enough that the victim is satisfied. And orcs, I don't need to tell you, crave a lot of blood. The code also sets up who runs the stronghold. The toughest male is made chief through proven combat, and he makes decisions and decides when the code of Malakath has been satisfied. All the women are either the chief's wives or his daughters, with the exception of the wise woman, who handles all the spiritual matters, much like a shaman would. In the stronghold, only the chief is allowed to have children, this ensures strength for the future generations. An orc grows up being told to fight for everything. 
You come into this world kicking and screaming, it is only fitting you leave in a similar fashion. In the strongholds, you won't find any old orc males. For an orc to live until he has gray in his hair is considered shameful. Their society has no place for people who have outlived their usefulness. To cling to a life that no longer serves a purpose is an affront to Malakath. Orcs who miraculously live to a ripe old age leave the stronghold to seek an honorable death in the wilds. Chieftains will never live to see this day, seeing as they rule a stronghold until their sons are strong enough to challenge them in one-on-one -on -one combat. This society in where only the strong are permitted to flourish and the weak perish has bred the orcs into some of the most merciless killers Tamriel has ever seen, and they don't much care what you think about that. The story of how the orcs arrived on Tamriel is one shrouded by myth and legend. But each time the story is retold, no matter in which language, it starts with one name, Trinimac. In a time before recorded history, when the elves resided in the Somerset Isles, there came an exodus. The Chimer whose descendants would one day be known as the Dark Elves were no longer content worshipping the Aedra in the Somerset Isles. What they sought was revolution, an exodus to the east, to Morrowind. The Aedra of the early Aldmer did not wish to see their elven brethren depart from them. As one of those early ancestors, Trinimac and his followers sought to stop the Great Exodus. However, the Daedric Prince of Plots and Deceiver of Nations outwitted Trinimac and devoured him. Assuming Trinimac's form, Boethia sowed seeds of chaos amongst the elves. The Daedric Prince succeeded in her plans and the final exodus of the Chimer was underway, but her work with the Elves of Somerset was only just beginning. Whether Boethia sought to punish Trinimac, the Elves who followed him, or if it's just in Adedra's nature, Boethia transformed the remains of Trinimac into a new Daedric Prince. The Daedric Prince of the Spurned and Ostracized, of the Sworn Oath and Bloody Curse. Trinimac was no more. Henceforth, he would be called Malakath, and his followers would be cursed to walk in as Alcas, forever transformed. This was the birth of a new race on Tamriel, the birth of the orcs. The early orcish people never stopped following Trinimac, even if he was something different now. Malakath still held the orcs to a code of honor and a tribal independent lifestyle. No matter which land they settled though, the orcs would always be considered trespassers by the other mortal races. Even in the face of this adversity, the orcs began to heavily settle in modern day Skyrim and High Rock, despite heated protests from the locals, which often resulted in well, a bloodbath. Although their race was widespread at the dawn of the first era, the orcs as a people never really knew what it was to have a home. Without anything permanent or lasting, it seemed history would scarcely remember the orcs and their culture. All the orcs were really lacking was a visionary, a leader to grease the wheels of progress. Tora Gro I Grown was the legendary chieftain who first envisioned a lasting home for the orcs. Up until this point, the idea of an orc city seemed impossible for a people who so feverishly clung to their independence. At first, it was merely a small collection of huts, but as word spread to the other orcs of Tamriel about this rising civilization in the mountains of High Rock, it soon grew into an industrious stronghold. The Bretons thought Orsinium to be little more than a desolate mountain region where the orcs secretly coveted the lands ruled by their noble families. According to the orcs, this was simply not the case. Bretons are prone to superstition and exaggeration, the great stronghold started to garner enough influence to make the orcs major players on Tamriel. Sadly for Orsinium, when you're a player in High Rock, the other players plot to take you back out again. As we learned previously, the bickering nobility of High Rock never rests, and the royal families weren't about to let the simple-minded orcs stake a claim without a fight. In the later years of the First Era, King Jolly of Daggerfall sent a letter to the renowned Altmer Battlemaster, Gaiden Shinji. Shinji led a famed group of knights from the province of Hammerfell. 
Their renown was so widespread they were known throughout Tamriel. That day, an alliance was formed, and the Red Guards joined the Bretons in a declaration of war against the Orcs. History remembers what followed as the Siege of Orsinium. With the finest swords Hammerfell had to offer, one would think Orsinium was liable to fall in a day. After all, what was an orcish brute versus the raw cunning of a Breton battle mage? Thirty long years passed, and the orcs of Orsinium would finally succumb to their overwhelming opposition, but not before slaying countless humans honorably on the field of battle, including the great Gaiden Shinji himself. The thirty-year siege of Orsinium would go down in history as the longest siege in Tamriel's history, and it made the orcs the most renowned warriors in the realm. With the fall of Orsinium, the orcs were once again forced to wander, and without a land to call their home, the other races of Tamriel held them with little regard. That was, until they needed them to pull their hides out of the fire. When an army of undead poured out of the realm of Cold Harbor to threaten Tamriel in the Second Era, the orc clans of High Rock were called upon to deliver the land from its destruction. The fight to save Tamriel would not be won alone, however, and the orcs would be forced to ally with those who sacked Orsinium centuries ago. Together with the Red Guards and Bretons, they formed what came to be called the Daggerfall Covenant. The orcs' contribution to the Covenant cannot be overstated. Not only did the orcs offer the Covenant some of the most fearsome warriors their front lines had ever seen, but their talented blacksmiths kept the Covenant equipped with the finest weapons and armor in all of Tamriel. Once the threat had subsided, however, the Covenant was thrown aside, and the orcs were thrown aside along with it. The coming of Tiber Septim's empire at the dawn of the Third Era had little to no effect on the orcs, considering they themselves weren't a sovereign nation. At least, not yet. As is the common trend with the orcs, the only thing they lacked was a proper leader, a visionary who would steer them to a brighter future, a future where they would no longer have to wander Tamriel. His name was Grotwag Gro Nagrum, the orc chieftain who envisioned the rebirth of a new Orsinium. As it turned out, this new Orsinium's future would not be secured by any act of war, but by more diplomatic means. Gortwa Gronagrum proved to be a superb politician and diplomat, a very useful skill set to have considering he was trying to secure a land in a province that was home to the Bretons. Not only did this orc chieftain successfully negotiate with the nobles of High Rock, but he gained an audience with the Emperor himself. Through trade and commerce with the Imperial Empire, Tamriel would finally recognize Orsinium as a serious political power, and the orcs garnered a newfound respect and cooperation the likes of which they had never known, and the Bretons once again took notice. History was about to repeat itself. Feeling threatened by the orcs of Orsinium, the Bretons once again seek its destruction. But they cannot take on the orcs without the help of their neighbors in Hammerfell. The Red Guards had assisted in the sacking of Orsinium once before, and they would do so again. But that is a story for another day. You could certainly call it a wasteland, rocks and sand as far as the eye can see. It's hard to believe anything could live here. Its harshness has been readily compared to the swamps of Argonia. Hammerfell is the barren scab of Tamriel, an unforgiving place that seems to want to kill anything living within it. Why would anything want to live here? How could anything live here? There are a people that not only survive in the land's cruel embrace, they thrive on it. The Red Guards didn't originate on Tamriel and yet they were the ones who tamed Hammerfell. And who else if not the Red Guards? Their dark complexion, agility, athletic frame, and curved swords are tailored for survival. Along with the Nords and Orcs, they are more muscular than the other mortal races, which in no small part has lent itself on the battlefield. They are considered by most to be the most naturally talented warriors in all of Tamriel. Their pride and fierce independence is on par with that of even the Dark Elves. 
The rest of Tamriel recognizes this, and Red Guards are the most well-employed mercenaries in the Nine Provinces. The Red Guards have claimed military superiority on land as well as on sea. Like every civilization before them, the Red Guards have been shaped by their homeland. Their seafaring heritage has made their navy into a force to be reckoned with. Even the Empire's best armadas have proved no match for the Yakutan fleet. As a race of sailors and adventurers, the Red Guards don't typically limit themselves to one armor style or dress. Although their desert environment has them sporting their distinctive headdress, no, as travelers, the Red Guards prefer to experience all the world has to offer. They have a cultural affinity for many weapon and armor styles. Since many of them freelance as swords. it is not uncommon to see a Red Guard dressed head to toe in many different armor sets, from many different cultures. Their culture does have its own unique style as well. Braided hair, tattoos, war paints, and piercings are commonplace amongst the Red Guards. They decorate their bodies almost as much as they decorate their lavish palaces. Yakutan architecture is some of the most ornate you'll find on Nern. If you're going to call a place home, you might as well spare no expense, that is, for the people who can afford it. Like most societies, the Red Guards have a class system, however, it is distinctively unique in its own foreign way. Ever since the Second Empire, Red Guard society has been formally divided into two political groups, who formed due to their places in society, the Crowns and the Forebears. The Crowns are the descendants of the High King and nobility who ruled back in the Red Guard homeland of Yakuda. They hold their old Yakutan tradition in high esteem and greatly dislike foreigners. The Forebears are descended from the Regatta warrior class. They are the keen edge of the blade, the hardened warriors who cleared the way for Red Guard civilization. Battle with the other provinces has exposed the Forebears to other warrior cultures such as the Nords. This exposure has made the Forebears more progressive than the Crowns, and thus more accepting of other cultures into their society. Thanks to the Forebears, Red Guard society is built on martial discipline. Every Red Guard, no matter their station in life, is expected to have a grasp of basic weaponry and combat. Only the strongest, fastest, and most cunning of Red Guards are then accepted into one of Hammerfell's many knightly orders. It's true that the Red Guards have an affinity for the martial arts, but generally speaking, the Red Guards of Hammerfell shun the use of specific schools of magic. The practice of Eastern magic, for example, is frowned upon by both the Crowns and the Forebears. Any foreigner using magic within Hammerfell's borders could easily become the subject of persecution. Many of the Red Guards believe magic is for the weak and wicked. In their ancient lore, they have cautionary tales of wizards who plague Nern, stealing souls to store into gems and tampering with minds, making brother fight against brother. In their eyes, such magic has no place in civil society. Now, that's not to say that Red Guard society is entirely civil itself. As we will learn, their history has been greatly influenced by their belief that violence is not only a fact of life, but a necessary means for growth. The story of the Red Guards is one of invasion, assimilation, and eventually expulsion. Though they most closely resemble the other races of men, the Red Guards have no ancestral ties with the Imperials of the Empire or the Nords of Admora. Nor does any elven blood run through their veins. No, the Red Guards are something entirely different. Theirs is a story that begins on the lost continent of Yakuda, in an age lost in the sands of time. Yakutan society was very advanced for its time. Yakuda natives were superior to those found among the other Tamriela kingdoms, and their astronomical knowledge, martial arts, agriculture, politics, and philosophy were the envy of the world. For reasons now lost to us, Yakuda's fate was sealed as it slipped into the Azurian Sea in ancient times. Most civilizations would have fallen along with their home, but the Yakudans were a seafaring people. Before it sank into the sea, Yakuda had been nothing but a collection of large islands, so it was only natural that its people were bred for navigation. And so it was the Yakudan fleet set sail to the east in search of a new home 
and a new challenge. The Yakudans were not looking to make friends in Tamriel, nor did they. Men and elves had already begun to settle the land, and that did not stop the regatta from carving them out. It is important to note that the Yakudan fleet was nothing short of an invasion, and the regatta took the coast of Hammerfell by storm. Later, when the rest of the refugees arrived on Tamriel, they erected their cities on the very ruins left behind by their warriors. Within a few short months, the foreign invaders had replaced the elven and Nordic forces who had fought over Hammerfell for centuries. The Yakudans had raided and adapted to the land so fast that the other mortal races had no choice but to yield Hammerfell to its new masters. Tamriel was made to recognize their new neighbors as Redguards, a grammatical corruption of the word regatta. Due to their aggressive expansion, one would think that the other races of Tamriel would hold a grudge towards the Red Guards. On the contrary, they had become famous as warriors, having bested even the orcs on the battlefield. No, it was actually the Red Guards who scorned their neighbors. Seeing themselves as invaders, they saw the races of Tamriel as weak. Looking through the lens of a martial culture, the Red Guards had little respect for those who couldn't even defend their own lands. From their new home in Hammerfell, the Red Guards held complete independence from the other provinces. So fierce was their independence that they wouldn't even partake in economic trade with the other races until the Bretons and Orcs proved their worth in the Siege of Orsinium centuries later. This newfound respect for the Bretons and the Orcs would lend itself to a new alliance in the dark days to come. When Tamriel skies darkened in the later years of the Second Era, Hammerfell faced the largest invasion since the Yakudans themselves raided its coasts millennia ago. In Hammerfell's darkest hour, an alliance was formed. The Bretons had earned their respect by spilling blood alongside the Red Guard centuries earlier, and it paved the way for the Daggerfall Covenant. Under the Covenant, the Red Guards fought side by side with the Orcs, and together, they showed Tamriel a means for survival. Once the Daedric threat had subsided, the Covenant was disbanded, and the Red Guards would be thrown into civil war. So dawns the Third Era, and Tiber Septim along with it. Many believed even Tiber Septim's Imperials would fail to take Hammerfell from those raised from birth to defend it. Yet when the Imperial Legions invaded the province, they met with little resistance. Civil war had left the Red Guards weaker than they had ever been, and in the chaos the organization of the Legion reigned supreme. Although they certainly did not ask for Tiber Septim or his empire, the Red Guards ended up benefiting immeasurably under the new regime. The forebears in particular welcomed the new opportunities and challenges the Empire had to offer them. Many Red Guards went on to serve under the Imperial Legion, which did much to strengthen their military. In general, Northern Hammerfell continued to be more traditionally Yakudan under the Empire, both in style, dress, and also personality. The Southern Lands, on the other hand, where the Forebears had landed, tended to be more progressive by adapting to Imperial customs. Following the cataclysmic event called the Warp in the West, or the Miracle of Peace, the Forebear Kingdom of Sentinel grew to encompass the entirety of the northern coast of Hammerfell, shifting the balance of power, making Hammerfell even more imperial in the coming centuries. Hammerfell's people were adapting under the Empire more and more each day, but in classic Yakudin tradition, this growth would not come without blood. A land dispute with the Bretons and an invasion from the Nords would sow the seeds of doubt in the minds of every Redguard. Hammerfell was losing land under imperial rule, and an empire too weak to defend its land is no empire worth keeping. With the coming of the Fourth Era, the Great War had erupted. The Almeri Dominion marched on the White Gold Tower, determined to deliver Tamriel back into the hands of the Elves. Even with the support of the other provinces, Emperor Titus Mede II proved weak, and in his cowardice he signed the White Gold Concordance with the Dominion, and with it, he betrayed the whole of Hammerfell. As a part of this peace treaty, the Dominion was given large tracts of land in southern Hammerfell, 
leaving the Red Guards to suffer the failure of its empire. The Old Merry Dominion marched on Hammerfell to claim the land given to them by Titus Mead. A challenge the Red Guards would surely answer. In the end, the heroic Red Guards met the Old Merry Dominion on the battlefield of Southern Hammerfell, and with ferocity, determination, and blood, they single-handedly brought the Dominion army to a standstill. The Red Guards say that their successful rebellion proves that the White Gold Concordance was a mistake. If the coward Titus Mead had kept his nerve, the Old Merry could have truly been defeated by the combined forces of Hammerfell and the rest of the Empire. But he did not keep his nerve, and although Hammerfell proved strong to resist, the rest of the Empire grows weaker with each passing day. As it stands, the Elves muster their forces in Valenwood, readying themselves to take back what is theirs by ancient right. But that is a story for another day. It is a sea of endless green, a maze of foliage with half-hidden cities growing like blooms from a flower. The home of the Bosmer is Tamriel's garden. Balenwood is the great forest in the southwest corner of Tamriel. Its crystal blue rivers, fertile soil, blooming gardens, and rolling hills are something you could only dream of. While the other lands of Tamriel lie tainted by mortal hands, the forests of Valenwood have been religiously guarded for millennia, making it a province unspoiled by man and myrrh. Beautiful, wild, untamed, and unkept, Valenwood is the purest example of what Tamriel would look like without the interference of mortals. Its wildlife flourishes and its trees reach out to kiss the heavens. One such tree is described as being eight times the size of the White Gold Tower. Here in the branches of this mighty tree, the Wood Elves have made a home for themselves. The caretakers of the forest call themselves Bosmer, but to the rest of the Empire, these tree dwellers are aptly named Wood Elves. These elves are one with the land, as wild and untamed as the forest they inhabit. Their days are spent traveling to and fro, moving through the trees like a fish through water. Although they are elves and thus descended from the Altmer of the Somerset Isles, the Bosmer have evolved into something entirely different. Like every civilization before them, the Wood Elves have been shaped by their homeland. Even for elves, the Bosmer have light frames. Their petite figure and keen eyes has fashioned their race into hunters of unmatched superiority. A wood elf is born with a bow in her hand, and every day afterward she must stalk and kill her prey if she wishes to survive. As the best archers in all of Tamriel, the Bosmer snatch and fire arrows in one continuous motion. Some scholars say it was they who invented the device. Whether or not that is true though, it does not matter. Marksmanship runs deep in the blood of every wood elf. Due to their religion and culture, the Wood Elves don't rely on wood for their bows. Rather, they fashion their weapons from the bones of dead animals. Their skills with the bow and special connection with the forest has tailored Valenwood's people into the guardians of nature they are today. Lying at the heart of Bosmeri religion and culture is an ancient creed known as the Green Pact. In the ancient spoken and written history of Bosmeri religion, a forest god made a pact with the early Altmer of Valenwood. In exchange for her patronage and protection, the elves would hold themselves to a strict code. For as long as their people called the forest home, they would not partake of its fruits nor harvest its wood to build their fires. The Bosmer would be strict carnivores under the meat mandate. Without the ability to use wood to build their structures or fruit to fill their stomachs, the Wood Elves have produced generations of hunters who waste no part of the animal. Any silk or cotton is imported from the other provinces, otherwise the Wood Elves exclusively trade in furs. Wooden structures and crafts do in fact exist within Valenwood's borders, but again, all is imported from the other corners of Tamriel. 
Seeing a wood elf in an imperial marketplace can be a funny thing. A Bosmer who has lived in Valenwood all their life hasn't been exposed to simple carpentry. Some creations of carpentry delight them to no end. Most of it has never occurred to them. They bring their own trade items like hides and bones and with it, they often buy woodcrafts that they have no use for or whose use they never bothered to find out. Most of the bravest elven warriors use wagon wheels as shields or wooden buckets as impressive headgear. Although the other provinces have gladly benefited from the trade the Green Pact has driven their way, there is a darker side to the Green Pact that has the other races looking at the wood elves with disgust. As a part of the meat mandate, the Bosmer are not allowed to waste any source of meat. Any source of meat. An enemy that falls on the battlefield must be eaten by the Bosmer who slayed him. Within three days time, a warrior must consume his fallen foe or risk breaking the pact. Needless to say, the other races of Tamriel see this cannibalism as unseemly and downright disgusting. As disgusting as it may be, this code in the Green Pact has kept the Wood Elves more friendly than the other races. The Bosmer do not like to engage in large conflicts for obvious reasons. However, if confrontation is inevitable, a Wood Elf will forego a long starvation period before the day of battle. We'd imagine that Bosmeri warriors must fight with a special vigor when they are starved for food. Don't let the savage tendencies of the Green Pact skew your outlook on the Wood Elves. Yes, their culture alienates them from just about every race here on Nern, and yes, most would be willing to eat you if their code demanded it, and yet the Wood Elves are some of the most friendly and light-hearted people you'll ever meet. The Elves of Valenwood have always stood ready to defend themselves against aggression, and have done so in many occasions. However, all things considered, the Bosmer seem to be the most pacifistic of all the races on Tamriel. Their capacity for empathy and humble lifestyles has made this race of Elves the most cooperative race throughout Tamriel's history. The history of Valenwood and its high-spirited people stretches back to the very beginning of recorded time. The first era was started in the great forests of Valenwood, but before that, the story begins in Old Mary's, in an age lost in the mists of time. Like all elves now residing in Tamriel, the story of the Bosmer starts with the Altmer leaving Old Mary's in the mythic era. After arriving in the Somerset Isles, the Bosmer rejected the stiff and formal traditions of the High Elven culture. Their people wished to be free, to spend their life in harmony with the land far from civilized society. These elves soon departed from their brethren, and as the ages passed, Valenwood transformed them into the agile hunters you see before you today. As the Altmer began to change their ways to match their new environment, adapting to the forest both in body and in mind, they became known as the Bosmer, or Tree Sap People. In exchange for the gifts the forest gave them, the Bosmer swore never to kill, injure, or eat any of the vegetation of their new home. The elves took refuge in the great migrating trees of Valenwood, and henceforth their fate would be made one with the woodlands. These elves lived a life as wild as the land they inhabited. It seemed improbable that Valenwood would ever resemble anything close to a kingdom, and yet history has a way of producing great men who endeavor to do the improbable. King Aplir was the early ruler of the province of Valenwood, and his ambition was made manifest when he united the wild Bosmer under his dynasty. So great and lasting was his rule, the Wood Elves would usher in the first era Tamriel had ever known. During the Cameron Dynasty, the Bosmer welcomed escaped human slaves from the Alien Empire. The early men of Cyrodiil had known nothing outside a life of slavery, and the Bosmer offered those who made it to Valenwood a life free from oppression. The grateful men and women who found a new life in the forest took to calling the locals Wood Elves. Later, when men fought their rebellion against the Alien Empire and formed their own Elysian Empire, the Wood Elves were the first to welcome man as equals with the signing of a trade treaty. Unfortunately, this peace between man and elf was short-lived, 
and thanks to a group of Elysian radicals, hostility grew between the dynasty and the empire. The Elysian order was spreading anti-Elven sentiments within the newly formed empire. They preached about the wickedness of their old Elven masters, while conveniently forgetting the support the Wood Elves had so kindly provided them in their hour of need. Skirmishes broke out along Valenwood's borders. At this time in history, the Elysian conflict with the Valenwood only helped quicken their fall from power, seeing as they were also fighting the Dureni hegemony of High Rock. Even after weathering the Elysian Empire's fall from glory, the men of Cyrodiil continued to make war with the Wood Elves of Valenwood. It seemed the war-mongering race of men would never leave the Bosmer alone. After a millennia of unrelenting warfare and devastating plague, Valenwood was left wide open for invasion. Under the Second Empire, Raymond Cyrodiil's wish was to divide the peoples of Valenwood so that they could never again pose a threat to man's interests in Tamriel. Eager to make sure that the Wood Elves would not unite against their new rulers, the dynasty was dissolved so that they would never again fight together as one. Now a divided people for the first time since the mythic era, the Bosmer reluctantly served as subjects under the Cyrodelic Empire. Eventually, like all empires, this one fell in the Second Era, and the old Cameron dynasty attempted to restore Valenwood to its former glory before men had so ruthlessly divided them. However, the damage had already been done. The Bosmer kingdoms were now too culturally different from each other to be united, and soon they began to war against one another and with the Khajiit in the east. Raymond Cyrodiil's dream of a divided Valenwood was fulfilled. Valenwood was slowly eating away at itself, and just as it seemed their former glory had diminished, never to return again. Circumstances changed. Valenwood would be reunited with their cousins in Somerset, and together, they would ensure their ancient legacy and an alliance that would echo through the ages. The empire that man had erected in Cyrodiil failed to protect Nern from those who would see it destroyed. The childish Imperials had all but doomed Tamriel, and thanks to their inexperience, the White Gold Tower is now home to the undead. The Daedric Prince Molag Bal threatens the whole of Tamriel, and it falls to the elder race of elves to restore balance in the mortal realm, deep within the forests of Valenwood. Elden Root becomes the birthplace of a new alliance between old friends. Queen Aren of the Somerset Isles forges a bond with the Bosmer of Valenwood and the Khajiit of elsewhere. The first Aldmeri Dominion is born. Under the Aldmeri banner, the Wood Elves were more unified and organized than they had ever been since the days of the Cameron Dynasty. The city of Elden Root was chosen as the capital of the Aldmeri Dominion because of its highly strategic location in the heart of Valenwood, and a good choice it was. With the Bosmer protecting the forest against invaders, Valenwood became the impenetrable shell of the Dominion. This defensive advantage left the Dominion free to enforce elven interests in Cyrodiil throughout the faction wars. The Aldmeri Dominion would see a second incarnation that was until the coming of Tiber Septum at the dawn of the Third Era. As the Imperial Legions encroached on Valenwood, you could imagine the general sentiment. The Bosmer had fought men for millennia in order to guard their sacred forests, and it seemed they would be forced to do so again. However, Tiber Septum had a different plan in mind. General Talos knew Valenwood was much like Black Marsh in that it was far too wild to tame. In his wisdom, Tiber Septum allowed the Wood Elves to keep their independence intact. Valenwood would continue to operate under its Cameron King while swearing fealty to the Empire. The result was 250 years of peace. A golden age. Surprisingly enough, the threat to peace that would end this age of prosperity came when the pretender to the Cameron throne seized control of the province through Daedric influence. Under his tyranny, Valenwood was forced to march to war against the other provinces, including Hammerfell and High Rock. At this moment in history, we look back at where the Bosmer started and what they had become. The once peaceful race of elves were exposed to conflict after conflict over the course of many centuries, and now, for the first time ever, they take the offensive approach by making war 
instead of fighting against it. It took two decades, but eventually the Wood Elves would find the strength to break the chains of their old Cameron dynasty. The Valen Wood that was left behind was a broken land, very different from the ideological dream the early Bosmer had when they first arrived in the Great Forest. No longer trusting the Empire or its own leaders, the Bosmer became more and more isolationist in temperament. For the first time in living memory, the Wood Elves began leaving their cities in favor for a life in the forests, a return to their earliest traditions. The Bosmer might have decided they were done dealing with their neighbors in Tamriel, but their neighbors surely weren't finished with them. As the Bosmer returned to the humble life of hunting and gathering, the Khajiit of elsewhere smell opportunity. They might have fought as comrades in the Dominion, but the Dominion is now but a memory. The Khajiit are infamous for taking what does not belong to them, and Valenwood is too great a prize to pass by. But that is a story for another day. The sun-baked lands of elsewhere resembles the harshness of Hammerfell in most cases, but travel further south and the land gives way to fertile soil, complete with river basins, sugarcane groves, and towering trees as far as the eye can see. Looking at elsewhere, one can easily see the contrast of north and south, golden sands and lush forests. To understand elsewhere is to understand the duality of its people. The feline race of humanoids who call themselves the Khajiit are some of the most interesting specimens Tamriel has ever produced. This quote-unquote beast race are as diverse and unpredictable as the shifting sands of the deserts they inhabit. If you ever hope to understand the Khajiit as a people, you must first understand the two most influential parts of their society, Masser and Secunda. Each and every Khajiit now living owes their very being to these two heavenly bodies in the nighttime sky. These lunar cycles are an integral part of Khajiit religion, culture, and biology. A traveler to Tamriel will describe the Khajiit as a bestial race of humanoids. They walk on two legs, dress like you or I would, yet they are also cat-like in appearance. They're covered in fur from head to toe, their eyes are capable of seeing in the dark, and their razor-sharp claws make them better bar brawlers than even the hardy Nords. What your average traveler doesn't know is that the Khajiit don't only come in one variety. On the contrary, Khajiit come in many different forms, some more bestial, while others more human. Theirs is a race that is eternally bound with the moons and their heavenly cycles. It all starts at birth. A newborn Khajiit is born into this world and appears incredibly similar to a small feline. Within a few short weeks, a newborn Khajiit assumes the form that Masser and Secunda has chosen for him. There are rumored to be more than 20 forms a Khajiit can inherit at birth, but here are just a few. When Masser is dark in the nighttime sky and Secunda is waning, the Khajiit that are born during this time become the Suthe Rot. These Khajiit boast many different fur patterns, but more importantly, they are the most commonly encountered Khajiit in Tamriel. These Khajiit are the ones our typical travelers are likely to encounter, seeing as they act as the face of their species and are normally found roaming the land as traders or caravanners. When Mazur is dark and Secunda shines bright in the nighttime sky, the Omes is born. Similar in many ways to the Bosmer, these Khajiit most closely resemble humanoids. From a distance, they could easily be mistaken for an elf, but upon closer examination, they are most certainly Khajiit. The Omes are one of the more common form of Khajiit found outside of the province of elsewhere. Taking advantage of the other race's preference of their more humanoid-like appearance, they are most likely found serving as ambassadors or traders. This breed of Khajiit will actually tattoo their faces in order to look more like their brothers and elsewhere. When Mazur is waxing and Secunda is waning, the Cathay Rot are born. The Cathay Rot have earned their place in history by being fearsome warriors. They are often called the Jaguar Men and are bulky and more physically imposing than the rest of their race. 
Despite their size, they are also known for being exceptional climbers. When Masser shines bright in the nighttime sky and Secunda is waning, we see the birth of the Sanche Rot battle cats. They are described as being the size of mammoths, carrying many Khajiit as a platform of war. When Masser is waning and Secunda shines bright, the unassuming Alfik are born. The Alfik are nearly indistinguishable from the common house cat, yet they are just as much Khajiit as their brothers. They possess a Khajiit's signature intelligence and can understand spoken languages even though they cannot speak it themselves. We assume the Alfik make excellent spies. After all, no one accuses a house cat of eavesdropping. One of the most important things to remember in all this is that all breeds of Khajiit, despite them looking so different, are in fact Khajiit. Each could theoretically interbreed and create another of their species. This offspring might very well look nothing like their father and mother. Their appearance is dependent solely on the phases of Nern's moons. Lastly, this brings us to the main. Only in the event of a complete lunar alignment, a main may be born. Only one main exists at any one time and the Khajiit believe that the main is one soul incarnating into many different bodies throughout the ages. The main acts as the nonpartisan spiritual leader and ruler of elsewhere. He does not wield the power of armies, seeing as the Khajiit have no standing armies. His power comes from the hearts and minds of the people of elsewhere. He has often had an important role to play both in tradition as well as religion and politics. The religious beliefs held in elsewhere are curious to say the least. Their deities very closely resemble the Aedra worshipped as the divines, only their gods resemble cats rather than men or elves. This is only proper, considering each race on Tamriel paints the gods in their own image. Their gods tend to be governed by passion and wit, prized characteristics amongst the Khajiit of elsewhere. As a race, they are quick thinkers, creatures of action. As such, they are most content living a life of adventure in pursuit of wealth or fame. A Khajiit tends to learn more by doing rather than reading. As a feline race, the Khajiit are incredibly acrobatic, quick with a blade, and as silent as a gentle morning's breeze. Some Khajiit can move through the trees with a speed and agility that would make a wood elf blush. This, combined with their quick wit, has bred them into Tamriel's most infamous thieves. The more bigoted citizens of Tamriel accuse all Khajiit of having sticky fingers. Some of the more unwelcoming races don't even let a Khajiit within their walls. Don't feel too bad for Khajiit though, this suspicion is not unfounded. The Khajiit people are known for being a shifty sort. You might barter a good trade from one of their race only to find your whole coin purse missing a few minutes later. They can be the most charming people you'll ever meet, or the most dangerous. Their race is known for their dual personality. Their people crave change, and this makes them much like their desert home and its ever-changing landscape. Just as the sands are constantly in flux, so are the Khajiit constantly unpredictable. Feeding into this unpredictability is a Khajiit's peculiar diet, and elsewhere, moon sugar is king. The natives refer to moon sugar as crystallized moonlight, but to the Khajiit it is so much more. As the chief export of elsewhere, sugar cane groves can be found in abundance in the jungles, where they can be harvested for trade with the other provinces. Regardless of the foreign demand for moon sugar, the product's best customers are closer to home. The Khajiit believe that by consuming it, they are consuming a small portion of the eternal souls of their moon gods, and from the moment it touches their lips, it drives them into fits of ecstasy. Walk down any street in one of elsewhere's major cities, and you'll find it strewn with catmen shivering in the grip of sugar fits. Travelers to elsewhere are warned to steer clear of the local food. Moon sugar might have a profound effect on the Khajiit, but it goes double for the other races. Skuma is the addictive, feel-good drug the Khajiit have perfected and supplied to Tamriel for many centuries. It is essentially refined moon sugar and is extremely addictive and hazardous, 
As such, it has been banned from many parts of Tamriel by order of the Empire. As we will learn though, even under the eyes of an Empire, the Khajiit are much too chaotic and independent to abide by any rules for any length of time. When Topal the pilot, the Altmer explorer, mapped Tamriel in the Murthic era, he and his crew found themselves sailing along the crystal blue waters of the Nibbin River. These early elven explorers had the misfortune of being stalked by Tamriel's most fearsome land predators, the early Khajiit. These catmen preyed on just about everything and caused many early elven settlers much distress. The ancient Bosmer, for instance, knew to avoid certain parts of Valenwood for fear of the great jungle cat men. From these early encounters with the elves, it is easy to assume that the Gajit, though most at home in their deserts, reigned as the dominant culture across southern Tamriel in ancient days. It is strange to think that so inhospitable a land as elsewhere, of scorching heat and crop-destroying wind, would have been the cradle for one of Tamriel's truly great races, but alas, the brutality of life's obstacles has a way of forging strong, thriving civilizations that can stand the test of time. And thrive they did. When the first historians began putting quill to paper, the Khajiit kingdoms were already a long-established cog in the Tamrielic machine. By the time the Bosmer had ushered in the first era, there were 16 independent realms that made up elsewhere. Unlike typical human and elvish kingdoms, these regions did not compete with one another for land and resources. Rather, the early Khajiit recognized each other's strengths and weaknesses. These 16 kingdoms worked together in harmony. This rare and unparalleled unity made this race of natives simply untouchable. The Elysian Empire of Man elected not to expand into modern day elsewhere for fear of retaliation and the Bosmer of Valenwood likewise knew how far eastward they dared to expand their kingdom. Sadly, Tamriel demands that all good things must end, and in the later years of the First Era, the terrible and devastating Thracian Plague destroyed the balance the Khajiit had cultivated. Refusing to be wiped out entirely, the Cat Men of elsewhere were reduced to two kingdoms, each representing one of their sacred moons, and each very different from one another. One, a desert kingdom with a tribal warrior culture, and the other, a jungle kingdom with a culture built around the persuasive power of coin. With no central power to keep them in check, the two kingdoms fought for supremacy without either ever getting the upper hand. It wasn't until the 309th year of the Second Era, when through a diplomatic marriage, the two Khajiit kingdoms were drawn together Fully recognizing just how historical this event was, the Khajiit kingdoms renamed their land after what we assume to be an old Khajiit proverb, a perfect society is always found elsewhere. Henceforth, the land would be known as elsewhere. Just as the Khajiit nobility were attempting to mend the land after centuries of inner struggle, outside forces were hard at work, endeavoring to destroy the land that had watched them grow. Following yet another horrific plague called the Nahatan Flu, the Khajiit were staring death in the face when Molag Bal's undead host sought to enslave Tamriel in the Second Era. In their darkest hour, their people were saved by an unexpected ally. Arin, Queen of the High Elves, assisted elsewhere by restoring order in the chaos that followed the plague. After saving their home and quite possibly them from extinction, the Khajiit of elsewhere pledged their unwavering loyalty to the High Elves of the Somerset Isles and by association, the Bosmer of Valenwood. Their newfound friendship formed the first Aldmeri Dominion. Under the Dominion, the Khajiit formed the boisterous front lines of every battle. Their versatility of race and skill with a blade as well as their claws earned themselves a reputation as warriors of superhuman ability. Looking back at the first Dominion, it is little wonder why the Khajiit have been welcomed back into the Dominion fold at each incarnation. The Khajiit would find some security in being absorbed into the Septum Empire of Man, only to later rebel. 
It's safe to say that the Khajiit will always crave change. But what happens when change does not favor them? In the early years of the fourth era, Khajiit society would be turned on its head when Master and Secunda suddenly vanished. The Khajiit, whose very being are attuned to the heavens and their lunar cycles, were thrown into disarray. Two years passed, and when Mazar and Secunda eventually reappeared, the Thalmor of the Aldmeri Dominion announced that it was they who used powerful magic to restore the moons. And what do you think happened after that? History, as it does, repeated itself. The Khajiit praised the High Elves as their saviors yet again. As popularity for the Dominion increased and support for the Empire diminished, the Thalmor led a coup against the Imperial-backed government in elsewhere. Now serving gladly under a reborn Dominion, the Khajiit will assist the High Elves in enforcing Elven interests across the land. With their feline friends in tow, the High Elves of the Somerset Isles pose a very real threat to man and his dominion over Tamriel. But that is a story for another day. The land called Somerset is the birthplace of a civilization and magic as we know it in Tamriel. Located off the coast of the mainland, the Somerset Isles were made famous by the High Elves whose story reaches back to the dawn of time. Simply put, they were the first the first farmers, the first scholars, the first mages, the first artists. The Crystal Tower stands proudly in the Somerset Isles as one of the largest monuments on Nern. It was not built in the honor of kings or emperors, rather it was built in honor of the early Aldmer ancestors who worked and bled so that Tamriel may know a future as rich as it is today. Thanks to their contributions, the citizens of Tamriel speak a common tongue and know the art of putting quill to parchment. It is safe to say that Tamriel as we know it today would be a lesser place if it weren't for the Altmer. The young race of men call them High Elves because these Elves think themselves better than the other mortal races. They're right. They are better. They drink the finest wines, wear the finest clothes, and surround themselves with riches and treasures unimaginable. But for an Altmer, it's not enough. A glass of wine, no matter how savory, or an enchanted blade, no matter how deadly, is never deemed worthy of their standards. In understanding why this is, we will get to know the Altmer as a people. A High Elf can live for over a thousand years, and during all that time he strives for perfection. A long lifespan ensures that the Altmer aren't amongst the best in Tamriel. They are the best, at nearly everything they do. In order to illustrate this, one only needs to look at their culture that stands as a shining example to the lesser races. Historians, both men and Mur, agree that High Elven culture is the most civilized in all the world. Intelligence is the most prized characteristic a High Elf can possess. While the inexperienced races of men and beasts give leadership roles to the best killers amongst them, the leaders of the High Elven society are scholars and thinkers. These race of intellectuals have unlocked the very secrets of Nern through their study of the arcane. They believe that everything that occupies Nern is magic, right down to the plants growing in the ground. This practice has given birth to the study of alchemy. As high-born, elder blood courses through their veins, and as a consequence, no mortal race matches their raw magical ability. The Bretons may have built for themselves a reputation on Tamriel as talented mystics, but a studied high elf makes any mage look like a conjurer of cheap tricks. Their divine given advantages don't stop there. The Altmer are amongst the tallest humanoids residing in Tamriel. Golden skin, slender frames, and sharp features proves that these elves are what they say they are. The purest example of the ancient elves that left Old Marys all those millennia ago. Altmer themselves are formal, which can make them seem cold and even pompous. While humans will focus more on individual appearance, Elves value the stature and presence of an individual far more. High Elves have a very high regard for proper order and uniform styles. 
The races of men usually don't take the time to try and understand all Mary society, and because of this lack of understanding, they jump to conclusions that often result in false prejudice. From the outside looking in, it is easy to dismiss the High Elves as arrogant. All it takes is one interaction with one member of their race, and a person can develop an early bias that they will carry with them for all time. To best illustrate this, we will look to a story of a first era human ambassador who had the rare privilege of visiting the Somerset Isles. Eric of Geis, a human ambassador for the Second Empire, spoke about how he could not understand the elven pursuit for perfection. They surround themselves with riches and treasures, the works of great artists, and the finest of everything. But they have no real appreciation for these things. What Eric of Geis wouldn't or couldn't understand is the fact that while he might look at a work of art and say it is perfect, a high elf who has practiced his craft for over a thousand years can see imperfections and brushstrokes far beyond what a short-lived man could ever hope to detect. Is this arrogance, or is it simply the advantage a long-lived race has over the childish race of men whose feelings are too easily hurt? The Aldmer, the precursor to all Tamrielic elves, began their story in the lost land of Ald Marys, in an age shrouded in the mist of time. We may never know why the ancient Aldmer decided to leave their home behind them, but eons ago they arrived in the Somerset Isles and Tamriel would never be the same. The Tamriel these elves discovered was very alien to the Tamriel we know today. In their ancient tapestries, the early Aldmer settlers depict the Somerset Isles as an untamed land full of now extinct creatures like men made of stone and giants taller than trees. And judging by these ancient records, we can assume that the early Aldmer must have been warriors of superior skill and tactics in order to defeat the many strange civilizations that called Somerset home before them, like the Khajiit of Elsewhere and the Red Guards of Yakuda who the elves have not yet met, their civilization was very advanced for its time. Early Aldmer society was built around agriculture and equal treatment of its people. Note that that equality, however, only extends to their people. Even early on in the evolution of their society, the elves kept slaves in the form of goblins, who the Aldmer used to perform jobs beneath their pedigree. Gradually, over a long period of time, their society grew too big for its own good. A hierarchy of classes began to form, which is still largely enforced in Somerset to this day. At the top are the wise, teachers, and priests. Below them are the artists, the princes, and the warriors. And lastly, we have the landowners, merchants, and workers. The religion of the people also changed because of this massive shift in their society, as highborn children of the godlike Aedra, the Altmer worshipped their ancestors, but no longer did the Altmer worship their own individual ancestors. Slowly and gradually over time, the Altmer formed a religion that revolved around the most powerful and well-known ancestors, Akatosh, Mara, and Stendar, all of whom are now worshipped as the divines by man, elf, and beast. Aldmeri religion forms the foundation for most of the other religious practices on mainland Tamriel, and thusly, it has been the single greatest legacy passed down to the younger races. Although it took place over the course of thousands of years, the Aldmer were changing, an odd thing for a culture who prized stasis and unified order. A group of elders would rebel against this trend, calling themselves the Sijiks and keepers of the old ways, they departed from the Altmer to settle in Artium, far away from what they called the corruption of elven society. The Sijiks went on to do many great things and produce many amazing people, including Vanis Galerian, founder of the Mages Guild, the same Mages Guild that made magic easily accessible to the common man. The Sijiks would go on to serve as advisors to both men and elves, and their wisdom has proven to be a valuable insight to man and mer alike. Their exodus from the Somerset Isles marks the first real record of elves splitting off from the original Aldmer that left Old Marys, the first of many an exodus. It was about this time in the Merithic era when Topau the pilot, the famous Aldmer explorer, 
set out to map the mysterious land of Tamriel. His expedition spoke of a Tamriel untouched and untamed. To the west, deserts as far as the eye can see. To the north, mountains whose roots run deep and peaks reach high. To the south, exotic jungles teeming with intelligent beasts like the Khajiit. Tamriel, wildly beautiful in its own seductive way, was a land where even the lowliest among the elves could live as kings, given the determination. With talks of this exciting new world on everyone's lips, many elves left Somerset to make a new life outside of the rigid Aldmer hierarchy. Some migrated to Valenwood and became the Bosmer, and others to Morrowind and became the Dunmer, and yet others settled in Skyrim, High Rock, and Cyrodiil, each new branch opening a new chapter to elven history, each with their own cultures, societies, and even religions. The Altmer of Lost Old Marys took Tamriel by storm, and the elves who elected to remain in Somerset became the Altmer, a slight deviation from the original name, Aldmer. An age would come and go, and the elves of Tamriel grew more and more defined by the lands they occupied. The Bosmer of Valenwood, now much shorter and agile, ushered in the first era of recorded history with their first Cameron dynasty. As the first era passed them by, it seemed the problems of mainland Tamriel were little more than amusing stories to the long-lived elves in Somerset. The Isles of the Highborn remained completely apart from the shores of the mainland and as such, it served as a perfect buffer for many of the conflicts that were arising in Tamriel at the time. The rise and fall of empires, the battles between men and Myr, none of these touched the Altmer. They had problems of their own. The Slodes of Thrace, physically unable to fight due to their massive girth, used necromantic magic and infernal machines to attack the Altmer throughout the First Era. Rumors say that the Slode were one of the original inhabitants of Somerset, and though they never succeeded in reclaiming Somerset, they waged a bloody crusade against the High Elves, which is still remembered today. To this day, it is on the seas that the High Elves excel in combat. There exist villages in the central valleys of Somerset that have never seen battle, but along the coast, it is a much different story. The Mormer were a group of elven exiles who relentlessly attacked the coast of Somerset in an effort to conquer the High Elves. Though they too never succeeded, they painted the coasts of Somerset crimson throughout the First and Second Eras. Though isolated from mainland Tamriel, the High Elves most certainly had problems of their own, but none of these threats came anywhere close to the Daedric threat stirring at the heart of Cyrodiil in the later years of the Second Era. In this, Tamriel's darkest hour, Queen Aren of the High Elves realized just how dangerous the younger races became if left to their own devices. Molag Bal's dark anchors mock the long-dead Aelids and the White Gold Tower which they constructed to honor the Aedra. Knowing this human blunder could not stand, the High Elves of Somerset called upon their cousins in Valenwood and the Khajiit of elsewhere. Together they conceived the first Old Mary Dominion. The races of men had inherited Cyrodiil after the Aelids, and look at what they did to it. In their mission to put an elven emperor back on the ruby throne, the High Elves led the Old Mary Dominion the only way they knew how, as talented sorcerers and wise tacticians. With their talented mages and gifted healers strengthening the ranks of every detachment, the Old Mary Dominion enforced elven interests in Cyrodiil throughout the faction wars. Thus, the Dominion thrived, that was, until the coming of Tiber Septum. It is now the dawning of the Third Era and Somerset is broken. General Talos and his legions were enough to deal with, but the Altmer were forced to look in horror as man employed the help of an old Dwemer relic known as Numidium. With this ancient elven device, the Empire's legion swept over the Somerset Isles like a plague, and before long, the Elder Race was made to answer to the juvenile race of mortals who had the impudence to impose their rule on a people far superior to theirs. The High Elves recalled the Tiber Wars with great shame and horror. 
Even Tiber Septim himself acknowledged that the Imperial Navy stood no chance against the far superior Elven Navy. It wasn't until the acquisition of the Numidium that the Empire actually stood a chance, and even then the High Elves fought tooth and nail to defend Somerset from the Imperials. It is important to note that Tiber Septim's victory over Somerset did more to harm the High Elves than any conquest ever waged on Tamrielic soil. The pride of its people, Somerset's most important asset, was broken. For thousands of years, the Ultimer have believed in their superiority to all the other races and cultures in Tamriel, and for much of this time they were right. But after the incorporation of Somerset into the Empire, doubts began to creep in. The High Elves, perhaps for the first time in their history, began second-guessing what it meant to be Ultimer. Some positive changes that did come out of this was the acceptance of new cultures and races into their lands. On the other hand, it is said to have paved the way for the second coming of the Thalmor. The High Elves have been reluctantly serving under the Septim Empire for centuries, and although they secured the highest seats in the Elder Council, they still had to answer to a human emperor. The Oblivion Crisis at the end of the Third Era hit the Empire hard, and it did not spare the Somerset Isles. During this time of strife and chaos, a new incarnation of the Thalmor arose in the Somerset Isles, reportedly claiming to have saved the Aldmeri people from Mehrun's Dagon and his Daedra host. The Empire of Man had run its course. Its failure to protect Somerset during the Oblivion Crisis had proved that. In the Fourth Era, Year 22, the Thalmor seized control of Somerset and renamed the land after the early reign of the King of Eleanor. The Somerset Isles were restored as an independent nation rising phoenix-like from the ashes of depravity brought on by its former human masters. Soon, the Bosmer joined them, and later the Khajiit. The Old Mary Dominion was born again, but the liberation of its own territory was not enough. The Thalmor wished nothing more than to see the elves restored to their former glory as the rightful rulers of Tamriel. It was elves that erected the White Gold Tower, it was elves that settled the land and bent it to their will in ancient times, and it would be elves who would endeavor to do so again. The Great War served as a message to the world, and no longer would elves sit on the sidelines of a history they wrote. As the Dominion forces closed in on the White Gold Tower after four years of bloody war, Titus Mead was forced to sign the White Gold Concordat. No longer would the warmonger Tiber Septim be worshipped as a god. The Aedra belonged to the Aldmer, and they would rather die than see man be honored as a deity. With the Imperials forced to accept these terms, the Thalmor sowed their own seeds of doubt into the minds of every man, much like man had done to them centuries prior. The effect this legislation had on the Greater Empire would be just as catastrophic as Numidium was on the Altmer centuries ago. Hammerfell rebelled and seceded from the Empire. Skyrim broke out into civil war, rendering it a liability to an Empire already crumbling from within. The mortal races and their seemingly endless struggle for dominance over Tamriel has left the land soaked in blood with much more blood yet to be spilled. And here we stand, at the crossroads of history. Man versus Elf, Admora versus Altmeris, Lorcan versus Trenimac, Daedra versus Aedra. Think on this. In essence, they are all the same battle. Order versus chaos. Stasis versus change. The Aedra may have created Tamriel and make up its fabric, but the chaotic law of the Daedra rules here. We have visited with guilds that worship this chaos, such as the Dark Brotherhood, whose roots run deep in Black Marsh. The Argonians, the bizarre reptilian race whom were raided for centuries by the Dark Elves of Morrowind, who in turn supplanted the technologically advanced Dwemer whose inventions are marveled at even today. Then we turned our eyes to the north, to the throat of the world itself, where the Nords carved out a life for themselves at the expense of the Snow Elves. Skyrim, a land where mighty dragons once roamed free, and whose legacy now serves as the sigil for the Imperial Empire, who broke the chains of old alien masters. 
Next, we journeyed to High Rock and Hammerfell, lands divided by more than just race. Then to Valenwood, whose sacred wildlife lies untouched by the industries of man and elf, and elsewhere whose people are as diverse as the personalities they personify. And finally, the Somerset Isles, where many claim the story of Tamriel truly began. You've reached the end of this audiobook, to be continued in Season 2. Special thanks to Bethesda, not only for their genre-defining series, but for their open support of our lore series. Watch the Elder Scrolls lore series on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash shoddycast.